the Habenula, disappointment. Here's my favorite piece of trivia in the whole world, Dr. Marie Skladowska Curie showed up to her wedding ceremony wearing her lab gown. It's actually a pretty cool story, a scientist friend hooked her up with Pierre Curie. They awkwardly admitted to having read each other's papers and flirted over beakers full of liquid uranium, and he proposed within the year. But Marie was only meant to be in France to get her degree, and reluctantly rejected him to return to Poland. Wump Wump. Enter the University of Krakow, villain and unintentional cupid of this story, which denied Marie a faculty position because she was a woman, very classy, U of K. Dick move, I know, but it had the fortunate side effect of pushing Marie right back into Pierre's loving, not yet radioactive arms. Those two beautiful nerds married in 1895, and Marie, who wasn't exactly making bank at the time, bought herself a wedding dress that was comfortable enough to use in the lab every day. My girl was nothing if not pragmatic. Of course, this story becomes significantly less cool if you fast forward 10 years or so, to when Pierre got himself run over by a carriage and left Marie and their two daughters alone in the world. Zoom into 1906, and that's where you'll find the real moral of this tale, trusting people to stick around is a bad idea. One way or another they'll end up gone. Maybe they'll slip on the Rue Dauphine on a rainy morning and get their skull crushed by a horse-drawn cart. Maybe they'll be kidnapped by aliens and vanish into the vastness of space. Or maybe they'll have sex with your best friend six months before you're due to get married, forcing you to call off the wedding and lose tons of cash in security deposits. The sky's the limit, really. One might say, then, that U of K is only a minor villain. Don't get me wrong, I love picturing Dr. Curie waltzing back to Krakow pretty woman, style, wearing her wedding slash lab gown, brandishing her two Nobel Prize medals, and yelling, big mistake. Big. Huge. But the real villain, the one that had Marie crying and staring at the ceiling in the late hours of the night, is loss. Grief. The intrinsic transience of human relationships. The real villain is love, an unstable isotope, constantly undergoing spontaneous nuclear decay. And it will forever go unpunished. Do you know what's reliable instead? What never, ever abandoned Dr. Curie in all her years? Her curiosity. Her discoveries. Her accomplishments. Science. Science is where it's at. Which is why when NASA notifies Meet Me, the Koenigswasser, that I've been chosen as lead investigator of Blink, one of their most prestigious neuroengineering research projects, I screech. I screech loudly and joyously in my minuscule, windowless office on the Bethesda campus of the National Institutes of Health. I screech about the amazing performance-enhancing technology I'm going to get to build for none other than NASA astronauts, and then I remember that the walls are toilet paper thin and that my left neighbor once filed a formal complaint against me for listening to 90s female alt-rock without headphones. So I press the back of my hand to my mouth, bite into it, and jump up and down as silently as possible while elation explodes inside me. I feel just like I imagine Dr. Curie must have felt when she was finally allowed to enroll at the University of Paris in late 1891, as though a world of, preferably non-radioactive, scientific discoveries is finally within grasping distance. It is, by far, the most momentous day of my life, and kicks off a phenomenal weekend of celebrations. Highlights are Times I tell the news to my three favorite colleagues, and we go out to our usual bar, guzzle several rounds of lemon drops, and take turns doing hilarious impressions of that time Trevor, our ugly middle-aged boss, asked us not to fall in love with him. Academic men tend to harbor many delusions except for Pierre Curie, of course. Pierre would never. Times I change my hair from pink to purple. I have to do it at home, because junior academics can't afford salons, my shower ends up looking like a mix between a cotton candy machine and a unicorn slaughterhouse, but after the raccoon incident, which, believe me, you don't want to know about, I wasn't going to get my security deposit back anyway. 
Times I take myself to Victoria's Secret and buy a set of pretty green lingerie, not allowing myself to feel guilty at the expense, even though it's been many years since someone has seen me without clothes, and if I have my way no one will for many, many more. Times I download the couch to marathon plan I've been meaning to start and do my first run. Then I limp back home cursing my overambition and promptly downgrade to a couch to 5k program. I can't believe that some people work out every day. Times I bake treats for Phineas, my elderly neighbor's equally elderly cat, who often visits my apartment for second dinner. He shreds my favorite pair of converse in gratitude. Dr. Curie, in her infinite wisdom, was probably a dog person. In short, I have an absolute blast. I'm not even sad when Monday comes. It's same old, same old experiments, lab meetings, eating lean cuisine and shotgunning store brand LaCroix at my desk while crunching data, but with the prospect of blink, even the old feels new and exciting. I'll be honest, I've been worried sick. After having four grant applications rejected in less than six months, I was sure that my career was stalling, maybe even over. Whenever Trevor called me into his office, I'd get palpitations and sweaty palms, sure that he'd tell me that my yearly contract wasn't going to be renewed. The last couple of years since graduating with my PhD haven't been a whole lot of fun. But that's over with. Contracting for NASA is a career-making opportunity. After all, I've been chosen after a ruthless selection process over golden boys like Josh Martin, Hank Malik, even Jan Vunderberg, that horrid guy who trash talks my research like it's an Olympic sport. I've had my setbacks, plenty of them, but after nearly two decades of being obsessed with the brain, here I am, lead neuroscientist of Blink. I'll design gears for astronauts, gears they'll use in space. This is how I get out of Trevor's clammy, sexist clutches. This is what buys me a long-term contract and my own lab with my own line of research. This is the turning point in my professional life, which, truthfully, is the only kind of life I care to have. For several days I'm ecstatic. I'm exhilarated. I'm ecstatically exhilarated. Then, on Monday at 4.33pm, my email pings with a message from NASA. I read the name of the person who will be co-leading Blink with me, and all of a sudden I'm none of those things anymore. Do you remember Levi Ward? Brent D. A. Et was, uh? Over the phone, Merrick's voice is thick and sleep-laden, muffled by poor reception and long distance. B. Is that you? What time is it? 8.15 in Maryland and I rapidly calculate the time difference. A few weeks ago Rika was in Tajikistan, but now she's in Portugal, maybe. 2 a.m. your time. Riker grunts, groans, moans, and makes a whole host of other sounds I'm all too familiar with from sharing a room with her for the first two decades of our lives. I sit back on my couch and wait it out until she asks, who died? No one died. Well, I'm sure someone died, but no one we know. Were you really sleeping? Are you sick? Should I fly out? I'm genuinely concerned that my sister isn't out clubbing, or skinny dipping in the Mediterranean Sea, or frolicking with a coven of warlocks based in the forests of the Iberian Peninsula. Sleeping at night is very out of character. Nah. I ran out of money again. She yawns. Been giving private lessons to rich, spoiled Portuguese boys during the day until I make enough to fly to Norway. I know better than to ask why Norway since Riker's answer would just be why not. Instead I go with, do you need me to send you some money? I'm not exactly flush with cash, especially after my days of, premature, as it turns out, celebrations, but I could spare a few dollars if I'm careful. And don't eat. For a couple of days. Nah, the brat's parents pay well. Ah, B, a 12-year-old tried to touch my boob yesterday. Gross. What did you do? I told him I'd cut off his fingers, of course. Anyway, to what do I owe the pleasure of being brutally awakened? I'm sorry. Nah, you're not. 
I smile. Nah, I'm not. What's the point of sharing 100% of your DNA with a person if you can't wake them up for an emergency chat? Remember that research project I mentioned. Blink. The one you're leading. NASA. Where you use your fancy brain science to build those fancy helmets to make fancy astronauts better in space. Yes. Sort of. As it turns out, I'm not leading as much as co-leading. The funds come from me and NASA. They got into a pissing contest over which agency should be in charge, and ultimately decided to have two leaders. In the corner of my eye I notice a flash of orange, Phineas, lounging on the sill of my kitchen window. I let him in with a few scratches on the head. He meows lovingly and licks my hand. Do you remember Levi Ward? Is he some guy I dated who's trying to reach me because he has gonorrhea? Huh? No. He's someone I met in grad school. I open the cupboard where I keep the whiskers. He was getting a PhD in engineering in my lab, and was in his fifth year when I started. The ward ass. Yep, him. I remember. Wasn't he like, hot? Tall? Built? I bite back a smile, pouring food in Phineas's bowl. I'm not sure how I feel about the fact that the only thing you remember about my grad school nemesis is that he was 6'4". Dr. Marie Curie's sisters, renowned physician Bronislaw Dluska and educational activist Helena Salayowa, would never. Unless they were thirsty wenches like Riker, in which case they absolutely would. And built. You should just be proud of my elephantine memory. And I am. Anyway, I was told who the NASA co-lead for my project will be, and... No way. Riker must have sat up. Her voice is suddenly crystal clear. No way. Yes way. I listen to my sister's maniacal, gleeful cackling while I toss the empty pouch. You know, you could at least pretend not to enjoy this so much. Oh, I could. But will I? Clearly not. Did you cry when you found out? No. Did you head desk? No. Don't lie to me. Do you have a bump on your forehead? Maybe a small one. O. B. B. Thank you for waking me up to share this outstanding piece of news. Isn't the ward ass the guy who said that you were fuggly? He never did, at least not in those terms, but I laugh so loud, Phineas gives me a startled glance. I can't believe you remember that. Hey. I resented it a lot. You're hot AF. You only say so because I look exactly like you. Why, I hadn't even noticed. It's not completely true, anyway. Yes, Riker and I are both short and slight. We have the same symmetrical features and blue eyes, the same straight dark hair. Still, we've long outgrown our parent trap stage and at 28 no one would struggle to tell us apart. Not when my hair has been different shades of pastel colors for the past decade, or with my love for piercings and the occasional tattoo. Riker, with her wanderlust and artistic inclinations, is the true free spirit of the family, but she can never be bothered to make free spirit fashion statements. That's where I, the supposedly boring scientist, come in to pick up the slack. So, was he? The one who insulted me by proxy? Yep. Levi Ward. The one and only. I pour water into a bowl for Phineas. It didn't go quite that way. Levi never explicitly insulted me. Implicitly, though. I gave my first academic talk in my second semester of grad school, and I took it very seriously. I memoized the entire speech redid the PowerPoint six times, even agonized over the perfect outfit. I ended up dressing nicer than usual, and Annie, my grad school best friend, had the well-meaning but unfortunate idea to rope Levi into complimenting me. Doesn't be look extra pretty today. It was probably the only topic of conversation she could think of. After all, 
Annie was always going on about how mysteriously handsome he was, with the dark hair and the broad shoulders and that interesting, unusual face of his, how she wished he'd stop being so reserved and ask her out. Except that Levi didn't seem interested in conversation. He studied me intensely, with those piercing green eyes of his. He stared at me from head to toe for several moments. And then he said. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. He just made what Tim, my ex-fiancé, later referred to as an aghast expression, and walked out of the lab with a wooden nod and zero compliments, not even a stilted, fake one. After that, grad school, the ultimate cesspool of gossip, did its thing, and the story took on a life of its own. Students said that he'd puked all over my dress, that he'd begged me on his knees to put a paper bag over my head, that he'd been so horrified, he tried to cleanse his brain by drinking bleach and suffered irreparable neurological damage as a consequence. I try not to take myself too seriously, and being part of a meme of sorts was amusing, but the rumours were so wild, I started to wonder if I really was revolting. Still, I never blamed Levi. I never resented him for refusing to be strong-armed into pretending that he found me attractive. Or, well, not repulsive. He always seemed like such a man's man, after all. Different from the boys that surrounded me. Serious, disciplined, a little broody. Intense and gifted. Alpha, whatever that even means. A girl with a septum piercing and a blue umber wouldn't conform to his ideals of what pretty ladies should look like, and that's fine. What I do resent Levi for are his other behaviours during the year we overlapped. Like the fact that he never bothered to meet my eyes when I talked to him, or that he always found excuses not to come to journal club when it was my turn to present. I reserve the right to be angry for how he'd slip out of a group conversation the moment I joined, for considering me so beneath his notice that he never even said hi when I walked into the lab, for the way I caught him staring at me with an intense, displeased expression, as though I was some eldritch abomination. I reserve the right to feel bitter that after Tim and I got engaged, Levi pulled him aside and told him that he could do much better than me. Come on, who does that? Most of all, I reserve the right to detest him for making it clear that he believed me to be a mediocre scientist. The rest I could have overlooked easily enough, but the lack of respect for my work. I'll forever grind my axe for that. That is, until I wedge it in his groin. Levi became my sworn archenemy on a Tuesday in April in my PhD advisor's office. Samantha Lee was, and still is, the bomb when it comes to neuroimaging. If there's a way to study a living human's brains without cracking their skull open, Sam either came up with it or mastered it. Her research is brilliant, well-funded, and highly interdisciplinary, hence the variety of PhD students she mentored, cognitive neuroscientists like me, interested in studying the neural bases of behavior, but also computer scientists biologists, psychologists, engineers. Even in the crowded chaos of Sam's lab, Levi stood out. He had a knack for the type of problem-solving Sam liked, the one that elevates neuroimaging to an art. In his first year, he figured out a way to build a portable infrared spectroscopy machine that had been puzzling postdocs for a decade. By his third, he'd revolutionized the lab's data analysis pipeline. In his fourth he got a science publication. And in his fifth, when I joined the lab, Sam called us together into her office. There is this amazing project I've been wanting to kickstart, she said with her usual enthusiasm. If we manage to make it work, it's going to change the entire landscape of the field. And that's why I need my best neuroscientist and my best engineer to collaborate on it. It was a breezy, early spring afternoon. I remember it well, because that morning had been unforgettable, Tim on one knee, in the middle of the lab, proposing. A bit theatrical, not really my thing, but I wasn't going to complain, not when it meant someone wanted to stand by me for good. So I looked him in the eyes, choked back the tears, and said yes. A few hours later, I felt the engagement ring bite painfully into my clenched fist. I don't have time for a collaboration, Sam, Levi said. He was standing as far away from me as he could, 
and yet he still managed to fill the small office and become its center of gravity. He didn't bother to glance at me. He never did. Sam frowned. The other day you said you'd be on board. I misspoke. His expression was unreadable. Uncompromising. Sorry, Sam. I'm just too busy. I cleared my throat and took a few steps toward him. I know I'm just a first-year student, I started, appeasingly, but I can do my part, I promise. And. That's not it, he said. His eyes briefly caught mine, green and black and stormy cold, and for a brief moment he seemed stuck, as though he couldn't look away. My heart stumbled. Like I said, I don't have time right now to take on new projects. I don't remember why I walked out of the office alone, nor why I decided to linger right outside. I told myself that it was fine. Levi was just busy. Everyone was busy. Academia was nothing but a bunch of busy people running around busily. I myself was super busy, because Sam was right, I was one of the best neuroscientists in the lab. I had plenty of my own work going on. Until I overheard Sam's concerned question, why did you change your mind? You said that the project was going to be a slam dunk. I know. But I can't. I'm sorry. Can't what? Work with B. Sam asked him why, but I didn't stop to listen. Pursuing any kind of graduate education requires a healthy dose of masochism, but I drew the line at sticking around while someone trash-talked me to my boss. I stormed off, and by the following week, when I heard Annie chattering happily about the fact that Levi had agreed to help her on her thesis project, I'd long stopped lying to myself. Levi Ward, his wardness, Dr. Wardass, despised me. Me. Specifically me. Yes, he was a taciturn, samba, brooding mountain of a man. He was private, an introvert. His temperament was reserved and aloof. I couldn't demand that he like me, and had no intention of doing so. Still, if he could be civil, polite, even friendly with everyone else, he could have made an effort with me, too. But no, Levi Ward clearly despised me, and in the face of such hatred. Well. I had no choice but to hate him back. You there? Riker asks. Yeah, I mumble, just ruminating about Levi. He's at NASA, then. Dare I hope he'll be sent to Mars to retrieve curiosity. Sadly, not before his done co-leading my project. In the past few years, while my career gasped for air like a hippo with sleep apnea, Levi's thrived obnoxiously so. He published interesting studies, got a huge Department of Defense grant, and, according to an email Sam sent around, even made Forbes's 10 under 40 list, the science edition. The only reason I've been able to stand his successes without falling on my sword is that his research has been gravitating away from neuroimaging. This made us not quite competitors and allowed me to just never think about him. An excellent life hack, which worked superbly until today. Honestly, fuck today. I'm still enjoying this immensely, but I'll make an effort to be sisterly and sympathetic. How concerned are you to be working with him, on a scale from one to heavily breathing into a paper bag? I tip what's left of Phineas's water into a pot of daisies. I think having to work with someone who thinks I'm a shit scientist warrants at least two inhalers. You're amazing. You're the best scientist. A.W., thank you. I choose to believe that Riker filing astrology and crystallotherapy under the label science only slightly detracts from the compliment. It's going to be horrible. The worst. If he's anything like he used to be, I'm going to. Riker, are you peeing? A beat, filled by the noise of running water. Maybe. Hey, you're the one who woke me and my bladder up. Please. Carry on. I smile and shake my head. If he's anything like he was at Pitt, he's going to be a nightmare to work with. Plus I'll be on his turf. 
Right, cause you're moving to Houston. For three months. My research assistant and I are leaving next week. I'm jealous. I'm going to be stuck here in Portugal for who knows how long, groped by knockoff Joffrey Brithians who refuse to learn what a subjunctive is. I'm rotting, B. It will never cease to befuddle me how differently Riker and I reacted to being thrown around like rubber balls during childhood, both before and after our parents' death. We were bounced from one extended family member to another, lived in a dozen countries, and all Riker wants is to live in even more countries. Travel, see new places, experience new things. It's like yearning for change is hardwired in her brain. She packed up the day we graduated high school and has been making her way through the continents for the past decade, complaining about being bored after a handful of weeks in one place. I'm the opposite. I want to put down roots. Security. Stability. I thought I'd get it with Tim, but like I said, relying on others is risky business. Permanence and love are clearly incompatible, so now I'm focusing on my career. I want a long-term position as a knee scientist, and landing Blink is the perfect stepping stone. You know what just occurred to me? You forgot to flush. Can't flush at night, noisy European pipes. If I do, my neighbor leaves passive-aggressive notes. But hear me out, three years ago, when I spent that summer harvesting watermelons in Australia, I met this guy from Houston. He was a riot. Cute, too. Bet I can find his email and ask him if he's single. Nope. He had really pretty eyes and could touch the tip of his nose with his tongue, that's, like, 10% of the population. I make a mental note to look up whether that's true. I'm going there to work, not to date nose tongue guy. You could do both. I don't date. Why? You know why? No, actually. Riker's tone takes on its usual stubborn quality. Listen, I know that the last time you dated. I was engaged. Same difference. Maybe things didn't go well I lift one eyebrow at the most euphemistic euphemism I've ever heard and you want to feel safe and practice maintenance of your emotional boundaries, but that can't prevent you from ever dating again. You can't put all your eggs into the science basket. There are other, better baskets. Like the sex basket, and the making out basket, and the letting a boy pay for your expensive vegan dinner basket, and Phineas chooses this very moment to meow loudly. Bless his little feline timing. B. Did you get that kitten you've been talking about? It's the neighbors. I lean over to nuzzle him. A silent thank you for distracting my sister mid-sermon. If you don't want to date nose tongue guy, at least get a damn cat. You already have that stupid name picked out. Miari Curie is a great name and no. It's your childhood dream. Remember when we were in Austria? How we'd play Harry Potter and your patroness was always a kitten. And yours was a blobfish. I smile. We read the books together in German, just a few weeks before moving to our maternal cousins in the UK, who wasn't exactly thrilled to have us stay in her minuscule spare room. Ah, oh, I hate moving. I'm sad to leave my objective le crappy but dearly beloved Betester apartment. Anyway, Harry Potter is tainted forever, and I'm not getting a cat. Why? Because it will die in 13 to 17 years, based on recent statistical data and shatter my heart in 13 to 17 pieces. Oh, for fuck's sake. I'll settle for loving other people's cats and never knowing when they pass away. I hear a thud, probably Riker throwing herself back into bed. You know what your condition is? It's called. Not a condition, we've been over. Avoidant attachment. You're pathologically independent and don't let others come close out of fear that they'll eventually leave you. You have erected a fence around you, the bee fence, and are terrified of anything resembling emotional Riker's voice fades into a jaw-breaking yawn, and I feel a wave of affection for her. 
Even though her favorite pastime is entering my personality traits into WEBMD and diagnosing me with imaginary disorders. Go to bed, Riker. I'll call you soon. Yeah, okay. Another small yawn. But I'm right, Beach. And you're wrong. Of course. Good night, babe. I hang up and spend a few more minutes petting Phineas. When he slips out to the fresh breeze of the early spring night, I begin to pack. As I fold my skinny jeans and colorful tops, I come across something I haven't seen in a while, a dress with yellow polka dots over blue cotton, the same blue of Dr. Curie's wedding gown. Target, spring collection, circa 5 million years ago. $12, give or take. It's the one I was wearing when Levi decided that I am but a sentient bunion, the most repugnant of nature's creatures. I shrug, and stuff it into my suitcase. 2. Vegas Nerve, Blackout. Be by the way, you can get leprosy from armadillos. I peel my nose away from the airplane window and glance at Rocio, my research assistant. Really? Yep. They got it from humans millennia ago, and now they're giving it back to us. She shrugs. Revenge and cold dishes and all that. I scrutinize her beautiful face for hints that she's lying. Her large dark eyes, heavily rimmed with eyeliner, are inscrutable. Her hair is so vantablack, it absorbs 99% of visible light. Her mouth is full, curved downward in its typical pout. Nope. I got nothing. Is this for real? Would I ever lie to you? Last week you swore to me that Stephen King was writing a Winner the Pooh spin-off. And I believed her. Like I believed that Lady Gaga is a known Satanist, or that badminton rackets are made from human bones and intestines. Chaotic goth misanthropy and creepy dead pan sarcasm are her brand, and I should know better than to take her seriously. Problem is, every once in a while she'll throw in a crazy-sounding story that upon further inspection, i.e., a Google search, is revealed to be true. For instance, did you know that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was inspired by a true story? Before OCO, I didn't. And I slept significantly better. Don't believe me, then. She shrugs, going back to her grad school admission prep book. Go pet the leper armadillos and die. She's such a weirdo. I adore her. Hey, you sure you're going to be fine, away from Alex for the next few months? I feel a little guilty for taking her away from her boyfriend. When I was 22, if someone had asked me to be apart from Tim for months, I'd have walked into the sea. Then again, hindsight has proven beyond doubt that I was a complete idiot and Rocio seems pretty enthused over the opportunity. She plans to apply to Johns Hopkins's neuro program in the fall, and the NASA line on her CV won't hurt. She even hugged me when I offered her the chance to come along a moment of weakness I'm sure she deeply regrets. Fine. Are you kidding? She looks at me like I'm insane. Three months in Texas, do you know how many times I'll get to see La Lorona? La, what? She rolls her eyes and pops in her airpods. You really know nothing about famed feminist ghosts. I bite back a smile and turn back to the window. In 1905, Dr. Curie decided to invest her Nobel Prize money into hiring her first research assistant. I wonder if she, too, ended up working with a mildly terrifying, chill who worshipping emo girl. I stare at the clouds until I'm bored, and then I take my phone out of my pocket and connect to the complimentary in-flight Wi-Fi. I glance at Rocio, making sure that she's not paying attention to me, and angle my screen away. I'm not a very secretive person, mostly out of laziness, I refuse to take on the cognitive labor of tracking lies and omissions. I do, however, have one secret. One single piece of information that I've never shared with anyone, not even my sister. Don't get me wrong, I trust Riker with my life, but I also know her well enough to picture the scene. She is wearing a flowy sundress, 
flirting with a Scottish shepherd she met in a trattoria on the Amalfi coast. They decide to do the shrooms they just purchased from a Belarusian farmer, and mid-trip she accidentally blurts out the one thing she's been expressly forbidden to repeat. Her twin sister, B, runs one of the most popular and controversial accounts on academic Twitter. The Scottish Shepherd's cousin is a closeted men's rights activist who sends me a dead possum in the mail, rats me out to his insane friends, and I get fired. No, thank you. I love my job, and possums, too much for this. I created at What Would Marie Do during my first semester of grad school. I was teaching a neuroanatomy class, and decided to give my students an anonymous mid-semester survey to ask for honest feedback on how to improve the course. What I got was, not that. I was told that my lectures would be more interesting if I delivered them naked. That I should gain some weight, get a boob job, stop dyeing my hair unnatural colours, get rid of my piercings. I was even given a phone number to call if I was ever in the mood for a 10-inch dick. Yeah, right. The messages were pretty appalling, but what sent me sobbing in a bathroom stall was the reactions of the other students in my cohort, Tim included. They laughed the comments off as harmless pranks and dissuaded me from reporting them to the department chair, telling me that I'd be making a stink about nothing. They were, of course, all men. Seriously, why are men? That night I fell asleep crying. The following day I got up, Wondered how many other women in STEM felt as alone as I did, and impulsively downloaded Twitter and made at What Would Marie Do. I slapped on a poorly photoshopped pic of Dr. Curie wearing sunglasses and a one-line bio, making the periodic table girlier since 1889, she her. I just wanted to scream into the void. I honestly didn't think that anyone would even see my first tweet. But I was wrong. At what would Marie do what would Dr. Curie, first female professor at La Sorbonne, do if one of her students asked her to deliver her lectures naked? At 198888 she would shorten his half-life. At an R rat him out to Pierre. At Emily 89 put some polonium in his pants and watch his dick shrivel. At Bioworm 55 nuke him nuke him. At Lucy and Thesia has this happened to you. God I'm so sorry. Once a student said something about my ass and it was so gross and no one believed me. Over half a decade later, after a handful of Chronicle of Higher Education nods, a New York Times article, and about a million followers, WWMD is my happy place. What's best is, I think the same is true for many others. The account has evolved into a therapeutic community of sorts, used by women in STEM to tell their stories, exchange advice, and bitch. Oh, we bitch. We bitch a lot, and it's glorious. At Biology Sarah Hay, at what would Marie do if she weren't given authorship on a project that was originally her idea and that she worked on for over one year? All other authors are men, because asterisk of course asterisk they are. Yikes. I scrunch my face and quote tweet Sarah. Marie would slip some radium in their coffee. Also, she would consider reporting this to her institution's Office of Research Integrity, making sure to document every step of the process. I hit send, drum my fingers on the armrest, and wait. My answers are not the main attraction of the account, not in the least. The real reason people reach out to WWMD is. Yep. This. I feel my grin widen as the replies start coming in. At D. Alex this happened to me, too. I was the only woman and only POC in the author lineup and my name suddenly disappeared during revisions. DM if you want to chat, Sarah. At Amy Bernard I am a member of the Women in Science Association, and we have advice for situations like this on our website, they're sadly common. At the geologician going through the same situation RN at Biologist era. I did report it to OI and it's still unfolding but I'm happy to talk if you need to vent. At Steve Harrison dude, breaking news, you're lying to yourself. Your contributions aren't valuable enough to warrant authorship. 
Your team did you a favor letting you tag along for a while but if you're not smart enough, you're out. Not everything is about being a woman, sometimes you're just a loser. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a community of women trying to mind their own business must be in want of a random man's opinion. I've long learned that engaging with basement-dwelling stem lords who come online looking for a fight is never a good idea, the last thing I want is to provide free entertainment for their fragile egos. If they want to blow off some steam, they can buy a gym membership or play third-person shooter video games. Like normal people. I make to hide at Steve Harrison's delightful contribution, but notice that someone has replied to him. At Schmackademics yeah, Marie, sometimes you're just a loser. Steve would know. I chuckle. At what would Marie do aw, Steve? Don't be too hard on yourself. At Schmackademics he is just a boy, standing in front of a girl, asking her to do twice as much work as he ever did in order to prove that she's worthy of becoming a scientist. At what would Marie do Steve, you old romantic? At Steve Harrison fuck you. This ridiculous push for women in STEM is ruining STEM. People should get jobs because they're good not because they have vaginas. But now people feel like they have to hire women and they get jobs over men who are more qualified. This is the end of STEM and it's wrong. At what would Marie do I can see you're upset about this, Steve. At Schmackademics there, there. Steve blocks both of us, and I chuckle again, drawing a curious glance from Rocio. At Schmackademics is another hugely popular account on academic Twitter, and by far my favorite. He mostly tweets about how he should be writing, makes fun of elitism and ivory tower academics, and points out bad or biased science. I was initially a bit distrustful of him, his bio says he him, and we all know how men on the internet can be. But he and I ended up forming an alliance of sorts. When the STEM lords take offense at the sheer idea of women in STEM and start pitchforking in my mentions, he helps me ridicule them a little. I'm not sure when we started direct messaging, when I stopped being afraid that he was secretly a retired gamergator out to dox me, or when I began considering him a friend. But a handful of years later, here we are, chatting about half a dozen different things a couple of times a week, without having even exchanged real names. Is it weird, knowing that Schmack had lice three times in second grade but not which time zone he lives in? A bit. But it's also liberating. Plus, having opinions online can be very dangerous. The internet is a sea full of creepy, cybercriminal fish, and if Mark Zuckerberg can cover his laptop webcam with a piece of tape, I reserve the right to keep things painfully anonymous. The flight attendant offers me a glass of water from a tray. I shake my head, smile, and DM Schmack. Marie, I think Steve doesn't want to play with us anymore. SHMAC, I think Steve wasn't held enough as a tadpole. Marie, lol. SHMAC, how's life? Marie, good. Cool new project starting next week. My ticket away from my gross boss. SHMAC, can't believe dude's still around. Marie, the power of connections. An inertia. What about you? SHMAC, works interesting. Marie, Good interesting. SHMAC, politicky interesting. So, no. Marie, I'm afraid to ask. How's the rest? SHMAC, weird. Marie, did your cat poop in your shoe again? SHMAC, no, but I did find a tomato in my boot the other day. Marie, send pics next time. What's going on? SHMAC, nothing, really. Marie, oh, come on. SHMAC, how do you even know something's going on? Marie, your lack of exclamation points. Schmack. 11. 1. Marie, 
Schmack. SHMAC, FYI, I'm sighing deeply. Marie, I bet. Tell me. SHMAC, it's a girl. Marie, do. Tell me everything. 11. 1. SHMAC, there isn't much to tell. Marie, did you just meet her? SHMAC, no. She's someone I've known for a long time, and now she's back. SHMAC, and she is married. Marie, to you? SHMAC, depressingly, no. SHMAC, sorry, we're restructuring the lab gotta go before someone destroys a 5 mil piece of equipment. Talk later. Marie, sure, but I'll want to know everything about your affair with a married woman. SHMAC, I wish. It's nice to know that Schmack is always a click away, especially now that I'm flying into the Wardass's frosty, unwelcoming lap. I switched to my email app to check if Levi has finally answered the email I sent three days ago. It was just a couple of lines, hey, long time no see, I look forward to working together again, would you like to meet to discuss Blink this weekend, but he must have been too busy to reply. Or too full of contempt. Or both. Ah. I lean back against the headrest and close my eyes, wondering how Dr. Curie would deal with Levi Ward. She'd probably hide some radioactive isotopes in his pockets, grab popcorn, and watch nuclear decay work its magic. Yep, sounds about right. After a few minutes, I fall asleep. I dream that Levi is part armadillo, his skin glows a faint, sallow green, and he's digging a tomato out of his boot with an expensive piece of equipment. Even with all of that, the weirdest thing about him is that he's finally being nice to me. We're put UP in small furnished apartments in a lodging facility just outside the Johnson Space Center, only a couple of minutes from the Sullivan Discovery Building, where we'll be working. I can't believe how short my commute is going to be. Bet you'll still manage to be late all the time. Rocio tells me, and I glare at her while unlocking my door. It's not my fault if I've spent a sizable chunk of my formative years in Italy, where time is but a polite suggestion. The place is considerably nicer than the apartment I rent, maybe because of the raccoon incident, probably because I buy 90% of my furniture from the Aziz bargain corner at Ikea. It has a balcony, a dishwasher, and a huge improvement in my quality of life, a toilet that flushes 100% of the times I push the lever. Truly paradigm shifting. I excitedly open and close every single cupboard, they're all empty, I'm not sure what I expected, take pictures to send Riker and my co-workers, stick my favorite Marie Curie magnet to the fridge, a picture of her holding a beaker that says I'm pretty rad, hang my hummingbird feeder on the balcony, and then... It's still only 2.30 p.m. Or. Not that I'm one of those people who hates having free time. I could easily spend five solid hours napping, re-watching an entire season of The Office while eating Twizzlers, or moving to step two of the couch to 5k plan I'm still very, okay, sort of committed to. But I am here. In Houston. Near the Space Center. About to start the coolest project of my life. It's Friday, and I'm not due to check in until Monday, but I'm brimming with nervous energy. So I text Rocio to ask whether she wants to check out the space center with me, no, or grab dinner together, I only eat animal carcasses. She's so mean. I love her. My first impression of Houston is, big. Closely followed by, humid, and then by, humidly big. In Maryland, remnants of snow still cling to the ground, but the space center is already lush and green, a mix of open spaces and large buildings and old NASA aircraft on display. There are families visiting, which makes it seem a little like an amusement park. I can't believe I'm going to be seeing rockets on my way to work for the next three months.
It sure beats the Perth Crossing Guard who works on the knee campus. The Discovery Building is on the outskirts of the centre. It's wide, futuristic, and three-storied, with glass walls and a complicated-looking stair system I can't quite figure out. I step inside the marble hall, wondering if my new office will have a window. I'm not used to natural light, the sudden intake of vitamin D might kill me. I'm B. Koenigswasser. I smile at the receptionist. I'm starting work here on Monday, and I was wondering if I could take a look around. He gives me an apologetic smile. I can't let you in if you don't have an ID badge. The engineering labs are upstairs, high security areas. Right. Yes. The engineering labs. Levi's labs. He's probably up there, hard at work. Engineering. Labbing. Not answering my emails. No problem, that's understandable. I'll just. Dr. Koenigswasser. B. I turn around. There is a blond young man behind me. He's non threateningly handsome, medium height, smiling at me like we're old friends, even though he doesn't look familiar. Hi? I didn't mean to eavesdrop, but I caught your name and. I'm Guy. Guy Kowalski. The name clicks immediately. I break into a grin. Guy. It's so nice to meet you in person. When I was first notified of Blink, Guy was my point of contact for logistics questions, and he and I emailed back and forth a few times. He's an astronaut and actual astronaut, working on Blink while he's grounded. He seemed so familiar with the project, I initially assumed he'd be my co-lead. He shakes my hand warmly. I love your work. I've read all your articles, you'll be such an asset to the project. Likewise. I can't wait to collaborate. If I weren't dehydrated from the flight, I'd probably tear up. I cannot believe that this man, this nice, pleasant man who has given me more positive interactions in one minute than Dr. Wardas did in one year, could have been my co-lead. I must have pissed off some god. Zeus. Eros. Must be Poseidon. Shouldn't have peed in the Baltic Sea during my misspent youth. Why don't I show you around? You can come in as my guest. He nods to the receptionist and gestures at me to follow him. I wouldn't want to take you away from astronauting. I'm between missions. Giving you a tour beats debugging any day. He shrugs, something boyishly charming about him. We'll get along great, I already know it. Have you lived in Houston long? I ask as we step into the elevator. About eight years. Came to NASA right out of grad school. Applied for the astronaut corps, did the training, then a mission. I do some math in my head. It would put him in his mid-thirties, older than I initially thought. The past two or so, I worked on Blink's precursor. Engineering the structure of the helmet, figuring out the wireless system. But we got to a point where we needed a neurostimulation expert on board. He gives me a warm smile. I cannot wait to see what we cook up together. I also cannot wait to find out why Levi was given the lead of this project over someone who has been on it for years. It just seems unfair. To Guy and to me. The elevator doors open, and he points to a quaint looking cafe in the corner. That place over there, amazing sandwiches. Worst coffee in the world. You hungry? No, thanks. You sure? It's on me. The egg sandwiches are almost as good as the coffee is bad. I don't really eat eggs. Let me guess, a vegan. I nod. I try hard to break the stereotypes that plague my people and not use the word vegan in my first three meetings with a new acquaintance but if they are the ones to mention it, all bets are off. I should introduce you to my daughter. She recently announced that she won't eat animal products anymore. He sighs. 
Last weekend I poured regular milk in her cereal figuring she wouldn't know the difference. She told me that her legal team will be in touch. How old is she? Just turned six. I laugh. Good luck with that. I stopped having meat at seven, when I realized that the delicious polo nuggets my Sicilian grandmother served nearly every day and the cute gal line grazing about the farm were more connected than I'd originally suspected. Stunning plot twist, I know. Riker wasn't nearly as distraught, when I frantically explained that pigs have families, two a mom and a dad and siblings that will miss them, she just nodded thoughtfully and said, what you're saying is, we should eat the whole family. I went fully vegan a couple of years later. Meanwhile, my sister has made it her life's goal to eat enough animal products for two. Together we emit one normal person's carbon footprint. The engineering labs are down this hallway, Guy says. The space is an interesting mix of glass and wood, and I can see inside some of the rooms. A bit cluttered, and most people are off today, we're shuffling around equipment and reorganizing the space. We've got lots of ongoing projects, but Blink's everyone's favorite child. The other astronauts pop by every once in a while just to ask how much longer it will be until their fancy swag is ready. I grin. For real? Yep. Making fancy swag for astronauts is my literal job description. I can add it to my LinkedIn profile. Not that anyone uses LinkedIn. The neuroscience labs, your labs, will be on the right. This way there are, his phone rings. Sorry, mind if I take it? Not at all. I smile at his beaver phone case, nature's engineer, and look away. I wonder whether Guy would think I'm lame if I snapped a few pictures of the building for my friends. I decide that I can live with that, but when I take out my phone I hear a noise from down the hallway. It's soft and chirpy and sounds a lot like a meow. I glance back at Guy. He's busy explaining how to put on Moana to someone very young, so I decide to investigate. Most of the rooms are deserted, labs full of large, abstruse equipment that looks like it belongs to, well, NASA. I hear male voices somewhere in the building, but no sign of the meow. I turn around. A few feet away, staring at me with a curious expression, is a beautiful young calico. And who might you be? I slowly hold out my hand. The kitten comes closer, delicately sniffs my fingers, and gives me a welcoming headbutt. I laugh. You're such a sweet girl. I squat down to scratch her under her chin. She nips my finger, a playful love bite. Aren't you the most perfect little baby? I feel so fortunate to have met you. She gives me a disdainful look and turns away. I think she understands puns. Come on, I was just kitten. Another outraged glare. Then she jumps on a nearby cart, piled ceiling high with boxes and heavy, precarious looking equipment. Where are you going? I squint, trying to figure out where she disappeared to and that's when I realize it. The equipment? The precarious looking equipment. It actually is precarious. And the cat poked it just enough to dislodge it. And it's falling on my head. Right. About. Now. I have less than three seconds to move away. Which is too bad, because my entire body is suddenly made of stone unresponsive to my brain's commands. I stand there, terrified, paralyzed, and close my eyes as a jumbled chaos of thoughts twists through my head. Is the cat okay? Am I going to die? Oh God, I am going to die. Squashed by a tungsten anvil like wild eat coyote. I am a 21st century Pierre Curie, about to get my skull crushed by a horse-drawn cart. Except that I have no chair in the physics department of the University of Paris to leave to my lovely spouse, Marie. Except that I have barely done a tenth of all the science I meant to do. Except that I wanted so many things and I never owe my god any second now. Something slams into my body, shoving me aside and into the wall. 
everything is pain. For a couple of seconds. Then the pain is over, and everything is noise, metal clanking as it plunges to the floor, horrified screaming, a shrill meow somewhere in the distance, and closer to my ear, someone is panting. Less than an inch from me. I open my eyes, gasping for breath, and... Green. All I can see is green. Not dark, like the grass outside, not dull, like the pistachios I had on the plane. This green is light, piercing, intense. Familiar, but hard to place, not unlike. Eyes. I'm looking up into the greenest eyes I've ever seen. Eyes that I've seen before. Eyes surrounded by wavy black hair and a face that's angles and sharp edges and full lips, a face that's offensively, imperfectly handsome. A face attached to a large, solid body a body that is pinning me to the wall, a body made of a broad chest and two thighs that could moonlight as redwoods. Easily. One is slotted between my legs and it's holding me up. Unyielding. This man even smells like a forest and that mouth. That mouth is still breathing heavily on top of me, probably from the effort of whisking me out from under 700 pounds of mechanical engineering tools, An. I know that mouth. Levi. Levi. I haven't seen Levi Ward in six years. Six blessed, blissful years. And now here he is, pushing me into a wall in the middle of NASA's space center, and he looks, he looks. Levi, someone yells. The clanking goes silent. What was meant to fall has settled on the floor. Are you okay? Levi doesn't move, nor does he look away. His mouth works, and so does his throat. His lips part to say something, but no sound comes out. Instead, a hand, at once rushed and gentle, reaches up to cup my face. It's so large, I feel perfectly cradled. Engulfed in green, cozy warmth. I whimper when it leaves my skin, a plaintive, involuntary sound from deep in my throat but I stop when I realize that it's only shifting to the back of my skull. To the hollow of my collarbone. To my brow, pushing back my hair. It's a cautious touch. Pressing but delicate. Lingering but urgent. As though he is studying me. Trying to make sure that I'm all in one piece. Memoizing me. I lift my eyes, and for the first time I notice the deep, unmasked concern in Levi's eyes. His lips move, and I think that maybe is he mouthing my name. Once, and then again. Like it's some kind of prayer. Levi? Levi, is she. My eyelids fall closed, and everything goes dark. 3. Angular Gyrus, pay attention. On weekdays, I usually set my alarm for 7 a.m. and then find myself snoozing it anywhere from three, raving success, to eight times, I hope a swarm of rabid locusts attacks me on my way to work, thus allowing me to find solace in the cold embrace of death. On Monday, however, the unprecedented happens, I'm up at 5.45, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. I spit out my night retainer, run into the bathroom, and don't even wait for the water to warm up to step under the shower. I am that eager. As I pour almond milk on my oatmeal, I give Red Dr. Curie the finger guns. Blink starting today, I tell the magnet. Send good vibes. Hold the radiations. I can't remember the last time I've been this excited. Probably because I've never been part of anything this exciting. I stand in front of my closet to pick out an outfit and focus on that, the sheer excitement, to avoid thinking about what happened on Friday. To be fair, there isn't much to think about. I only remember up until the moment I fainted. Yes, I swooned in his wardness manly arms like a 20th century hysteric with penis envy. It's nothing new, really. I faint all the time, when I haven't eaten in a while, when I see pictures of large, hairy spiders, when I stand up too quickly from a sitting position. My body's puzzling inability to maintain minimal blood pressure in the face of normal everyday events makes me, as Riker likes to say, 
a syncope aficionado. Doctors are puzzled but ultimately unconcerned. I've long learned to dust myself off as soon as I regain consciousness and go about my business. Friday, though, was different. I came to in a few moments, kept nowhere in sight, but my neurons must have still been misfiring because I hallucinated something that could never happen, Levi Ward bridal carrying me to the lobby and gently laying me on one of the couches. Then I must have hallucinated some more, Levi Ward viciously tearing a new one into the engineer who'd left the cart unattended. That had to have been a fever dream, for several reasons. First of all, Levi is terrifying, but not that terrifying. His brand is more kill em with ice cold indifference and silent contempt than angry outbursts. Unless in our time apart has embraced a whole new level of terrifying, in which case lovely. Second, it's difficult, and by difficult I mean impossible, to imagine him siding against a non-me party in any me-involved accident. Yes, he did save my life, but there's a good chance he had no idea who I even was when he shoved me against the wall. This is Dr. Wardas, after all. The man who once stood for a two-hour meeting rather than take the last empty seat because it was next to me. The man who exited a game of poker he was winning because someone dealt me in. The man who hugged everyone in the lab on his last day at Pitt, and promptly switched to handshakes when it was my turn. If he caught someone stabbing me, he'd probably blame me for walking into the knife and then take out his whetstone. Clearly, my brain wasn't at her best on Friday. And I could stand here, stare at my closet, and agonize over the fact that my grad school nemesis saved my life. Or I could bask in my excitement and pick an outfit. I opt for black skinny jeans and a polka darted red top. I pull up my hair in braids that would make a Dutch milkmaid proud, put on red lipstick, and keep the jewelry to a relative minimum, the usual earrings, my favorite septum piercing and my maternal grandmother's ring on my left hand. It's a bit weird to wear someone else's wedding ring, but it's the only memento I have of my nonna, and I like to put it on when I need some good luck. Riker and I moved to Messina to be with her right after our parents died. We ended up having to move again just three years later when she passed, but out of all the short-lived homes, out of all the extended relatives, nonna is the one who loved us the most. So Riker wears her engagement ring, and I wear her wedding band. Even Stephen. I shoot a quick, uplifting tweet from my WWMD account, Happy Monday. Keep calm and Curie Owen, friends, and head out. You excited? I ask Rocio when I pick her up. She stares at me darkly and says, in France, the guillotine was used as recently as 1977. I take it as an invitation to shut up, and I do, smiling like an idiot. I'm still smiling when we get our NASA ID pictures taken and when we later meet up with Guy for a formal tour. It's a smile fueled by positive energy and hope. A smile that says, I'm going to rock this project and watch me stimulate your brain and I'm going to make neuroscience my bitch. A smile that falters when Guy swipes his badge to unlock yet another empty room. And here's where the transcranial magnetic stimulation device will be, he says, just another variation of the same sentence I've heard over. And over. And over. Here is where the electroencephalography lab will be. Here you'll do participant intake once the review board approves the project. Here will be the testing room you asked for. Just a lot of rooms that will be, but aren't yet. Even though communications between NASA and me indicated that everything needed to carry out the study would be here when I started. I try to keep on smiling. It's hopefully just a delay. Besides, when Dr. Curie was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1903, she didn't even have a proper lab, and did all of her research out of a converted shed. Science, I tell myself in my inner Jeff Goldblum voice, finds a way. Then Guy opens the last room and says, and here's the office you two will share. Your computer should arrive soon. That is when my smile turns into a frown. It's nice, the office. 
large and bright, with refreshingly not rusted through desks and chairs that will provide just the right amount of lumber support. And yet, first of all, it's as distant from the engineering labs as possible. I'm not kidding, if someone grabbed a protractor and solved for x, i.e., the point that's farthest from Levi's office, they'd find that x equals my desk. So much for interdisciplinary workspaces and collaborative layouts. But that's almost secondary, because... Did you say computer? Singular. Rocio looks horrified. Like, one? Guy nods. The one you put on your list. We need, like, ten computers for the type of data processing we do, she points out. We're talking multivariate statistics. Independent component analysis. Multidimensional scaling and recursive partitioning. Six Sigma. So you need more? At the very least, buy us an abacus. Guy blinks, confused. A what? We put five computers on our list, I interject with a side look at Rocio. We will need all of them. Okay. He nods, taking out his phone. I'll make a note to tell Levi. We're heading to meet him right now. Follow me. My heartbeat accelerates, probably because the last time I saw Levi my brain confabulated that he was carrying me an officer and a gentleman, style, and the previous came on the tail of a year of him treating me like I'm a tax auditor. I'm nervously playing with my grandmother's ring and wondering what disaster of galactic proportions this next meeting has in store for me, when something catches my eye through the glass wall. Guy notices. Want a sneak peek at the helmet prototype, he asks. My eyes widen. Is that what's in there? He nods and smiles. Just the shell for now, but I can show you. That would be amazing, I gasp. Embarrassing, how breathless I sound when I get excited. I need to follow through with my couch to 5k plans. The lab is much larger than I expected, dozens of benches, machines I've never seen before pressed against the wall, and several researchers at various stations. I feel a frisson of resentment, how come Levi's lab, unlike mine, is fully stocked, but it quiets down the instant I see it. It. Blink is a complex, delicate, high-stakes project, but its mission is straightforward enough, to use what is known about magnetic stimulation of the brain, my jam, to engineer special helmets, Levi's expertise, that will reduce the attentional blinks of astronauts, those little lapses in awareness that are unavoidable when many things happen at once. It's the culmination of decades of gathering knowledge, of engineers perfecting wireless stimulation technology on one side and neuroscientists mapping the brain on the other. Now, here we are. Neuroscience and engineering, sitting in a very expensive tree called Blink, K-I-S-S-I-N-G. It's hard to communicate how groundbreaking this is, two separate slices of abstract research bridging the gap between academia and the real world. For any scientist, the prospect would be exhilarating. For me, after the mild shitshow my career has put up in the past couple of years, it's a dream come true. All the more now that I'm standing in front of tangible proof of said dream's existence. That's the... Yep. Rocio murmurs, wow, and for once doesn't even sound like a sullen Lovecraftian teenager. I tease her about it, but I can't focus on anything but the helmet prototype. Guy is saying something about design and stage of development, but I tune him out and step closer. I knew that it'd be made from a combination of Kevlar and carbon fiber cloth, that the visor would carry thermal and eye tracking capabilities, that the structure would be streamlined to host new functionalities. What I did not know was how stunning it would look. A breathtaking piece of hardware, designed to house the software I've been hired to create. It's beautiful. It's sleek. It's wrong. It's all wrong. 
I frown, peering closer at the pattern of holes in the inner shell. Are these for the neurostimulation output? The engineer working at the helmet station gives me a confused look. This is Dr. Koenigswasser, Lamar, Guy explains. The neuroscientist from NIH. The one who fainted. I knew this would haunt me, because it always does. My nickname in high school was Smelling Salts B. Damn my useless autonomic nervous system. The one and only. I smile. Is this the final placement for the output holes? Should be. Why? I lean closer. It won't work. A brief silence follows, and I study the rest of the grid. Why do you say that? Guy asks. They're too close, the holes, I mean. It looks like you used the international 10 to 20 system, which is great to record brain data, but for neurostimulation. I bite into my lip. Here, for instance. This area will stimulate the angular gyrus, right? Maybe. Let me just check. Lamar scrambles to look at a chart, but I don't need confirmation. The brain is the one place where I never get lost. Upper part, stimulation at the right frequency will get you increased awareness. Which is exactly what we want, right? But stimulation of the lower part can cause hallucinations. People experiencing a shadow following them, feeling as though they're in two places at the same time, stuff like that. Think of the consequences if someone was in space while that happened. I tap the inner shell with my fingernail. The outputs will need to be farther apart. But. Lamar sounds severely distressed. This is Dr. Ward's design. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Dr. Ward knows nothing about the angular gyrus, I murmur distractedly. The ensuing silence should probably tip me off. At least, I should notice the sudden shift in the atmosphere of the lab. But I don't and keep staring at the helmet, writing possible modifications and workarounds in my head, until a throat clears somewhere in the back of the room. That's when I lift my eyes and see him. Levi. Standing in the entrance. Staring at me. Just staring at me. A tall, stern, snow-tipped mountain. With his expression, the one from years ago, silent and unsmiling. A veritable Mount Fuji of disdain. Shit. My cheeks burn. Of course. But of course, he just caught me trash-talking his neuroanatomy skills in front of his team like a total asshole. This is my life, after all, a flaming ball of scorching, untimely awkwardness. Boris and I are in the conference room. You ready to meet, he asks, his voice a deep, severe baritone. My heart thuds. I rack my brain for something to say in response. Then Guy speaks and I realize that Levi isn't even addressing me. He is, in fact, completely ignoring me and what I just said. Yep. We were just about to head there. Got sidetracked. Levi nods once and turns around, a silent but clear order to follow him that everyone seems eager to obey. He was like that in grad school, too. Natural leader. Commanding presence. Someone whose bad side you wouldn't want to be on. Enter me. A proud resident of his bad side for several years, who just renewed her housing permit with a few simple words. Is that Dr. Ward? Rocio whispers as we enter the conference room. Yep. Well. That was excellent timing, boss. I wince. What are the chances that he didn't hear me? I don't know. What are the chances that his personal hygiene is very poor and he has huge wax balls in his ear canal? The room is already crowded. I sigh and take the first empty seat I can find, only to realize that it's across from Levi. Awkwardness level, nuclear. I'm making better and better choices today. 
Cheering erupts when someone deposits two large boxes of donuts in the center of the table. NASA employees are clearly as enthused by free food as regular academics. People start calling dibs and elbowing each other, and Guy yells over the chaos, the one in the corner, with the blue frosting, is vegan. I shoot him a grateful smile and he winks at me. He's such a nice guy, my almost co-leader. As I wait for the crowd to disperse, I take stock of the room. Levi's team appears to be worst fest material. The well-known meat wave. A dick explosion in the testosterone. The good old brodio. Aside from Rocio and I, there's one single woman, a young blonde currently looking at her phone. My gaze is mesmerized by her perfect beach waves and the pink glitter of her nails. I have to force myself to look away. A. Worst fest is bad, but it's at least a small step up from cockcluster, which is what Annie and I called academic meetings with only one woman in the room. I've been in cockcluster situations countless times in grad school, and they range from unpleasantly isolating to wildly terrifying. Annie and I used to coordinate to attend meetings together, not that hard, since we were symbiotic anyway. Sadly, none of my male cohort ever got how awful worst fest and cockcluster are for women. Grad school's stressful for everyone, Tim would say when I complained about my entirely male advisory committee. You keep going on about Marie Curie, she was the only woman in all of science at the time, and she got two Nobel Prizes. Of course, Dr. Curie was not the only female scientist at the time. Dr. Liz Meitner, Dr. Emmy Neither, Alice Ball, Dr. Nettie Stevens, Harrietta Levitt, and countless others were active, doing better science with the tip of their little fingers than Tim will ever manage with his sorry ass. But Tim didn't know that. Because, as I now know, Tim was dumb. We're ready to start. The balding red-headed man at the head of the table claps his hands, and people scurry to their seats. I lean forward to grab my vegan donut, but my hand freezes in mid-air. It's not there anymore. I inspect the box several times, but there's only cinnamon left. Then I lift my eyes and I see it, blue frosting disappearing behind Levi's teeth as he takes a bite. A bite of my damn donut. There are dozens of alternatives, but behold, the wardass chose the one I could eat. What kind of careless, inconsiderate boob steals the single available option from a starving, needy vegan? I am Dr. Boris Covington, the redhead starts. He looks like an exhausted, disheveled ginger hard-boiled egg. Like he ran here for this meeting, but there are five stacks of paperwork on his desk waiting for him. I'm in charge of overseeing all research projects here in the Discovery Institute, which makes me your boss. Everyone laughs, with a few good-natured boos. The engineering team seems to be a rowdy bunch. You guys already know that, with the notable exception of Dr. Koenigswasser and Ms. Cortorial, who are here to make sure we don't fail at one of our most ambitious projects yet. Levi's going to be their point of contact, but, everyone, please make them feel welcome. Everyone claps except for Levi, who is busy finishing his, my. Donut. What an absolute dingus. Now let's pretend that I gave an impressive speech and move on to everyone's favorite activity, icebreakers. Almost everyone groans, but I think I'm a fan of Boris. He seems much better than my knee boss. For instance, he's been speaking for one whole minute and hasn't said anything overtly offensive. I want your name, job, and let's do favorite movie. More groans. Hush, children. Levi, you start. Everyone in the room turns to him, but he takes his sweet time swallowing my donut. I stare at his throat, and an odd mix of phantom sensations hits me. His thigh pushing between mine. Being pressed into the wall. The woodsy smell at the base of his. Wait. What? Levi Ward, head engineer. And. He licks some sugar off his bottom lip. The Empire strikes back. Oh, are you kidding me? First he steals my donut, and now my favorite movie. Kaylee Jackson, the blonde picks up. I'm project manager for Blink, and legally blonde. 
She talks a bit like she could be one of a Woodsy sorority sisters, which makes me like her instinctively. But Rocio tenses beside me. When I glance at her, her brows are furrowed. Weird. There are at least 30 people in the room, and the icebreakers get old very soon. I try to pay attention, but Lamar Evans and Mark Costello start fighting over whether Kill Bill, Volume 2 is better than Volume 1 and I feel a weird prickle in the center of my forehead. When I turn, Levi's staring hard at me, his eyes full of that something that I seem to awaken in him. I'm a bit resentful about the donut, not to mention that he still hasn't answered my email, but I remind myself of what Boris just said, he's my main collaborator. So I play nice and give him a cautious, slow to unfurl smile that I hope communicates sorry about the angular gyrus jab, and I hope we'll work well together, and hey, Thank you for saving my life. He breaks eye contact without smiling back and takes a sip of his coffee. God, I hate him so. B. Rocio elbows me. It's your turn. Oh, um, right. Sorry. B. Koenigswasser, head of neuroscience. And. I hesitate. Empire strikes back. With the corner of my eye I see Levi's fist clench on the table. Crap. I should have just said Avatar. Once the meeting is over, Kaylee comes to speak to Rocio. Ms. Cortorial. May I call you Rocio? I need your signature on this document. She smiles sweetly and holds out a pen, which Rocio doesn't accept. Instead she freezes, staring at Kaylee with her mouth open for several seconds. I have to elbow her in the ribs to get her to defrost. Interesting. You're left-handed, Kaylee says while Rocio signs. Me too. Lefty's power, right? Rocio doesn't look up. Left-handed people are more prone to migraines, allergies, sleep deprivation, alcoholism, and on average live three years less than right-hand people. Oh. Kaylee's eyes widen. I, um, didn't. I'd love to stay and witness more Prime Valley girl and goth interaction, but Levi's stepping out of the room. As much as I load the idea, we'll need to talk at some point, so I run after him. When I reach him, I'm pitifully out of breath. Levi, wait up. I might be reading too much into the way his spine goes rigid but something about how he stops reminds me of an inmate getting caught by the guards just a step away from breaking out of prison. He turns around slowly, hulking but surprisingly graceful, all black and green and that strange, intense face. It was actually a thing, back in grad school. Something to debate while waiting for participants to show up and analyses to run, is Levi actually handsome? Or is he just six foot and built like the Colossus of Rhodes? There were plenty of opinions going around. Annie, for instance, was very much in camp 10 out of 10, would have a torrid affair with. And I'd tell her you, yikes, and laugh, and call her a traitor. Which, yeah. Turned out to be accurate, but for completely different reasons. In hindsight, I'm not sure why I used to be so shocked about his fan club. It's not so outlandish that a serious, taciturn man who has several nature neuroscience publications and looks like he could bench press the entire faculty body in either hand would be considered attractive. Not that I ever did. Or ever will. In fact, I'm absolutely not thinking again about his thigh pushing between my legs. Hey. I smile tentatively. He doesn't answer, so I continue, thank you for the other day. Still no answer. So I continue some more. I wasn't, you know, standing in front of that cart for shits and giggles. I need to stop twisting my grandmother's ring. Stat there was a cat, so. A cat? Yeah. A calico. A kitten. Mostly white, with orange and black spots on the ears. She had the cutest little. I notice his skeptical look. For real there was a cat. Inside the building? Yes. I frown. She jumped on the cart. 
made the boxes fall. He nods, clearly unconvinced. Fantastic, now he thinks I'm making up the cat. Wait. Am I making up the cat? Did I hallucinate it? Did I? Can I help you with anything? Oh. I scratched the back of my head. No. I just wanted to, ah, uh, tell you how excited I am to collaborate again. He doesn't immediately reply, and a terrible thought occurs to me, Levi doesn't remember me. He has no idea who I am. Um, we used to be in the same lab at Pitt. I was a first year when you graduated. We didn't overlap long, but. His jaw tenses, then immediately relaxes. I remember, he says. Oh, good. It's a relief. My grad school arch nemesis forgetting about me would be a bit humiliating. I thought you might not, so. I have a functioning hippocampus. He looks away and adds, a little gruffly, I thought you'd be at Vanderbilt. With Schreiber. I'm surprised he knows about that. When I made plans to go work in Schreiber's lab, the best of the best in my field, Levi had long moved on from Pitt. The point is, of course, moot, because after all the happenings of two years ago happened, I ended up scrambling to find another position. But I don't like to think about that time. So I say, nope, keeping my tone neutral to avoid bearing my throat to the hyena. I'm at NIH. Under Trevor Slate. But he's great, too. He really isn't. And not just because he enjoys reminding me that women have smaller brains than men. How's Tim? Now, that's a mean question. I know for a fact that Tim and Levi have ongoing collaborations. They even hosted a panel together at the main conference in our field last year, which means that Levi knows that Tim and I called off our wedding. Plus, he must be aware of what Tim did to me. For the simple reason that everyone knows what Tim did to me. Lab mates, faculty members, janitors, the lady who manned the sandwich station in the pit cafeteria, they all knew. Long before I did. I make myself smile. Good. He's good. I doubt it's a lie. People like Tim always land on their feet, after all. Unlike people like me, who fall on their metaphorical asses, break their tailbones, and spend years paying off the medical bills. Hey, what I said earlier, about the angular gyrus. I didn't mean to be rude. I wasn't thinking. It's okay. I hope you're not mad. I didn't mean to overstep. I'm not mad. I stare up at his face. He doesn't seem mad. Then again, he also doesn't seem not mad. He just seems like the old Levi, quietly intense, unreadable, not at all fond of me. Good. Great. My eyes fall to his large bicep, and then to his fist. He is clenching it again. Guess Dr. Warder still dislikes me. Whatever. His problem. Maybe I have a bad aura. It doesn't matter, I'm here to get a job done, and I will. I square my shoulders. Guy gave me a tour earlier. I noticed that none of our equipment's here yet. What's the ETA for that? His lips press together. We are working on it. I'll keep you posted. Okay. My eye and I can't get anything done until our computers arrive, so the earlier the better. I'll keep you posted, he repeats tersely. Cool. When can we meet to discuss Blink? Email me with times that work for you. They all do. I don't have a schedule until my equipment arrives, so. Please, email me. His tone, patient and firm, screams I'm an adult dealing with a difficult child, so I don't insist further. Okay. Will do. I nod, half-heartedly wave my goodbye, and turn to walk away. I can't wait to work with this guy for three months. I love being treated like I'm a piece of belly button lint instead of a valuable asset to a team. That's why I got a PhD in neuroscience, 
to achieve nuisance status and be patronized by the wardusses of the world. Lucky me for. There's one more thing, he says. I turn back and tilt my head. His expression is as closed off as usual, and why the hell is the feel of his thigh in my brain again? Not now, intrusive thoughts. The Discovery Building has a dress code. His words don't land immediately. Then they do, and I look down to my clothes. He can't possibly mean me, can he? I'm wearing jeans and a blouse. He is wearing jeans and a Houston Marathon t-shirt. God, he's probably one of those obnoxious people who post their workout stats on social media. Yes. I prompt him, hoping he'll explain himself. Piercings, certain hair colors, certain types of makeup are unacceptable. I see his eyes fall on one of the braids draped over my shoulder and then drift upward to a spot above my head. As though he can't bear to look at me longer than a split second. As though my sight, my existence, offends him. I'll make sure Kaylee sends you the handbook. Unacceptable. Correct. And you're telling me this because. Please, make sure you follow the dress code. I want to kick him in the shins. Or maybe punch him. No, what I really want is to grab his chin and force him to stare at what he clearly considers my ugly, offensive face some more. Instead I put my hands on my hips and smile. That's interesting. I keep my tone pleasant enough. Because I am a pleasant person, damn it. Because half of your team are wearing sweats or shorts, have visible tattoos, and Aaron, I believe is his name, has a gauge in his ear. It makes me wonder if maybe there's a gendered double standard at play here. He closes his eyes, as though trying to collect himself. As though staving off a wave of anger. Anger at what? My piercings? My hair? My corporeal form? Just make sure you follow the dress code. I cannot believe this chucklefuck. Are you serious? He nods. All of a sudden I am too mad to be in his presence. Very well. I'll make an effort to look acceptable from now on. I whirl around and walk back to the conference room. If my shoulder brushes his torso on my way there, I am too busy not kneeing him in the nuts to apologize. 4. Parahippocampal gyrus, suspicion. And my second day on blink is almost as good as my first. What do you mean, we can't get inside our office? I told you. Someone dug a moat around it and filled it with alligators. And bears. And carnivorous moths. I stare silently at Rocio and she sighs, swiping her ID through the reader by the door. It blinks red and makes a flat noise. Our badges don't work. I roll my eyes. I'll go find Kaylee. She can probably fix this. No. She sounds so uncharacteristically panicked, I lift an eyebrow. No. Don't call Kaylee. Let's just knock the door down. Count of three. One, two. Why shouldn't I call Kaylee? Because. Her throat bobs. I don't like her. She's a witch. She might curse our families. All our firstborns shall have ingrown toenails, for centuries to come. I thought you didn't want kids. I don't. I'm worried about you, boss. I tilt my head. Ro, is this heat stroke? Should I buy you a hat? Houston's much warmer than Baltimore. Maybe we should just go home. It's not like our equipment is here. What are we even going to do? She's being so weird. Though, to be fair, she's always weird. Well, I brought my laptop, so we can- Oh, guy. Hey. Do you have time to answer a couple of questions for me? Of course. Could you let us into our office? Our badges aren't working. He opens the door and immediately asks me about brain stimulation and spatial cognition, 
and over an hour goes by. It might be tricky to get to deep structures, but we can find a workaround, I tell him toward the end. There's a piece of paper full of diagrams and stylized brains between us. As soon as the equipment arrives, I can show you. I bite the inside of my cheek, hesitant. Hey, can I ask you something? A date. No, I. Good, because I prefer figures. I smile. Guy reminds me a bit of my British cousin, total charmer, adorable smile. Same. I. Is there a reason the neuro equipment isn't here yet? I know Levi is supposed to be my point of contact, but he's currently sitting on three unanswered emails. I'm not sure how to get him to reply. Use Comic Sans. Write in primary colors. Um. Guy bites his lip and looks around. Rocio is coding away on her laptop with AirPods in her ears. I heard Kaylee say that it's an authorization problem. Authorization. For the funds to be dispersed and new equipment to be brought in, several people need to sign off. I frown. Who needs to sign off? Well, Boris. His superiors. Levi, of course. Whatever the holdup is, I'm sure he'll fix it soon. Levi is as likely to be the holdup as I am to make a mistake while filing my taxes, i.e., very, but I don't point that out. Have you known him long? Levi, I mean. Years. He was very close to Peter. I think that's why Levi threw his name in the hat for Blink. I want to ask who Peter is, but Guy seems to assume I already know. Is he someone I met yesterday? I'm so bad with names. He's a fantastic engineer and a great team leader. He was at the Jet Propulsion Lab when I was on my first space mission. I know they were sad to see him transfer. I frown. This morning I walked past him chatting with the engineers and they were all laughing at something sports ball he'd just said. I choose to believe that they were just sucking up to him. Okay, he's good at his job, but he can't possibly be a beloved boss, can he? Not Dr. Wardness of the intractable disposition and wintry personality. And since we're talking, why the hell did they decide to transfer someone from the JPL instead of having Guy lead? Must be divine punishment. I guess I kicked lots of puppies in a past life. Maybe I used to be Dracula. Levi's a good guy, Guy continues. A good bro, too. He owns a truck, helped me move out after my ex kicked me out. Of course he does. Of course he drives a vehicle with a huge environmental footprint that's probably responsible for the death of 20 seagulls a day. While chomping on my vegan donut. Also, we sometimes babysit playdates together. Having beers and talking about Battlestar Galactica vastly improves the experience of watching two six-year-olds arguing over who gets to be Moana. My jaw drops. What? Levi has a child. A small, human child. I wouldn't worry about the equipment, B. Levi will take care of it. He's great at getting stuff done. Guy winks at me as he stands. I can't wait to see what you two geniuses come up with. Levi will take care of it. I watch Guy step out and wonder if more ominous words were ever uttered. Fun fact about me, I am a fairly mellow person, but I happen to have a very violent fantasy life. Maybe it's an overactive amygdala. Maybe it's too much estrogen. Maybe it's the lack of parental role models in my formative years. I honestly don't know what the cause is, but the fact remains, I sometimes daydream about murdering people. By sometimes, I mean often. And by people, I mean Levi Ward. I have my first vivid reverie on my third day at NASA, when I imagine offing him with poison. I'd be satisfied with a quick and painless end, as long as I got to proudly stand over his lifeless body kick it in the ribs, and proclaim, this is for not answering even one of my seven emails. Then I'd casually stomp on one of his humongous hands and add, 
and this is for never being in your office when I tried to corner you there. It's a nice fantasy. It sustains me in my free time, which is plentiful. Because my ability to do my work hinges on my ability to magnetically stimulate brains, which in turn hinges on the arrival of my damn equipment. By the fourth day, I'm convinced that Levi needs some miracle blade stabbing. I ambush him in the shared kitchen on the second floor, where he's pouring coffee into a Star Wars mug with a baby Yoda picture. It says Yoda best engineer and it's so adorably cute, he doesn't deserve it. I briefly wonder if he bought it himself, or if it's a present from his child. If that's the case, he doesn't deserve the child, either. Hey! I smile up at him, leaning my hip against the sink. God, he's so tall. And broad. He's a thousand-year oak. Someone with a body like this has no business owning a nerdy mug. How are you? His head jerks down to look at me, and for a split moment his eyes look panicked. Trapped. It quickly melts into his usual non-expression, but not before his hand slips. Some coffee sloshes over the rim, and he almost gives himself third-degree burns. I'm a cave troll. I'm so unpleasant to be around, I make him clumsy. The sheer power I hold. Hi, he says, drying himself with kitchen paper. No fine. No and you? No boy howdy, the weather's humid today. I sigh internally. Any news about the equipment? We're working on it. It's amazing how good he is at looking to me without actually looking at me. If it were an Olympic discipline, he'd have a gold medal and his picture on a Wheaties box. Why exactly is it not here yet? Any issues with the knee funds? Authorizations. But we're working on it, yes. I'm still smiling. Murderously polite. The neuroscience on positive reinforcement is solid, it's all about the dopamine. Whose authorizations are we waiting for? His muscles, many and enormous, stiffen. A couple. His eyes fall on me and then on my thumb, which is twisting around my grandmother's ring. They immediately bounce away. Who are we missing? Maybe I can talk to them. See if I can speed up things. No. Right. Of course. Can I see the blueprints for the prototype? Make a few notes. They are on the server. You have access. Do I? I sent you an email about that, and about. A phone rings in his pocket. He checks the caller ID and answers with a soft hey before I can continue. I hear a female voice on the other side. Levi doesn't look at me as he mouths, excuse me, and slips out of the kitchen. I'm left alone. Alone with my stabbing dreams. On the fifth day, my fantasies evolve yet again. I'm walking to my office, schlepping a refill bottle for the water cooler and half-heartedly considering using it to drown Levi, his hair seems long enough to hold onto while I push his head underwater, but I could also tie an anvil to his neck. Then I hear voices inside and stop to listen. Okay, fine, to eavesdrop. In Houston? Rocio is asking. Five or six years, a deep voice answers. Levi's. And how many times have you seen La Llorona? A pause. Is that the woman from the legend? Not a woman, she scoffs. A tall lady ghost with dark hair. Wronged by a man, she drowned her own children in revenge. Now she dresses in white, like a bride, and weeps on the banks of rivers and streams throughout the south. Because she regrets it. No. She's trying to lure more children to bodies of water and drown them. She's amazing. I want to be her. Levi's soft laugh surprises me. And so does his tone, gently teasing. Warm. What the hell? I've never had the, um, pleasure, but I can recommend nearby hiking trails with water. I'll send you an email. What is happening? Why is he conversing? 
like a normal person. Not with grunts, or nods, or clipped fragments of words, but in actual sentences. And why is he promising to send emails? Does he know how to? And why, why, why am I thinking about the way he pinned me against that stupid wall? Again. That would be great. I normally avoid nature, but I am ready to brave clean air and sunlight for my favorite celebrity. I don't think she qualifies as a... I step into the office and immediately halt, dumbstruck by the most extraordinary sight I have ever laid my eyes upon. Dr. Levi Ward. Is. Smiling. Apparently, the Wardass can smile. At people. He possesses the necessary facial muscles. Though the second I step inside, his dimpled, boyish grin fades, and his eyes darken. Maybe he can only smile at some people. Maybe I'm just not considered people. Morning, boss. Rocio waves at me from her desk. Levi let me in. Our badges still aren't working. Thanks, Levi. Any idea when they will? Icy green. Can green be icy? The one in his eyes sure manages to. We're working on it. He makes for the door, and I think he's going to leave, but instead he picks up the refill bottle I dragged here, lifts it with one hand one. One. Hand, and lodges it on top of the cooler. You don't have to. It's no problem, he says. He should be sent to jail for the way his biceps look. At least for a little bit. Also, please lock him up for being gone before I can ask if our equipment will ever arrive, if he'll ever answer my emails, if I'll ever be worthy of a compound sentence made of multiple clauses. Boss? I slowly turn to Rocio. She's looking at me, inquisitive. Yep. I don't think Levi likes you very much. I sigh. I shouldn't be involving Rocio in this weird feud of ours, partly because it seems unprofessional, partly because I'm not sure what she'll blurt out at the most inappropriate moment. On the other hand, there's no point in denying the obvious. We know each other from before. Levi and I. Before you publicly announced that his shit at neuroscience, you mean? Yeah. I see. You do? Of course. You two had a passionate love story that slowly soured, culminating when you caught Levi in an intimate embrace with your butler, stabbed his abdomen six to nine times, and left him for dead only to be astonished to find him still alive when you arrived in Houston. I cock my head. Do you really think two scientists could afford a butler? She mulls it over. Okay, that part's unrealistic. Levi and I were in grad school together. And we. I honestly have no idea how to put it diplomatically. I want to say didn't get along, but there was never an along to be gotten. We never interacted, because he discouraged it or avoided it. He was never a fan. She nods like she finds the idea relatable. That little scorpion. I love her. Did he hate you at first sight, or did he grow into it? Oh, he, I stop short. I actually have no idea. I try to think back to my first meeting with him, but I can't remember it. It must have been on my first day of grad school, when Tim and I joined Sam's lab, but I have no memories. He was vaguely hostile to me well before the incident in Sam's office, when he declined to collaborate, but I can't place the start of it. Interesting. I guess Tim or Annie might know. Except that I'd rather slowly perish from cobalt poisoning than ever speak to either of them again. I'm not sure. I shrug. A combination. Is Levi's dislike related to the fact that I just spent a week on TikTok because I don't have a decent computer to work on? I plop down in my chair. I suspect the two things are very related, but it's not as if I can prove it, or know what to do about it. It's an isolating situation. I've considered talking to other people here at NASA, or even at NIH, but they'd just point out that Levi needs me to make the project succeed, 
and that the idea of him self-sabotaging just to sabotage me is preposterous. They might even think that I'm the one who's in the wrong, since I haven't proven myself as a project leader yet. And there's something else to consider. Something that I don't want to say out loud, or even think in my head, but here goes, if my career is a sapling, Levi's is a bearbab. It can withstand a lot more. He has a history of completed grants and successful collaborations. Blink's failure would be a bump in the road for him, and a car totaling crash for me. Am I being paranoid? Probably. I need to lay off the coffee and stop spending my nights plotting Levi's demise. He's living rent-free in my head. Meanwhile, he doesn't even know my last name. I don't know, Ro. I sigh. They might be related. Or not. Ham. She rocks back in her chair. I wonder if pointing out that his revenge plan is harming not just your career prospects but an innocent bystander's, too, would help. The innocent bystander is me, by the way. I bite back a smile. Thank you for clarifying. You know what you should do. Please don't say stab his abdomen six to nine times. I wasn't going to. That's too good advice to waste on you. No, you should ask at what would Marie do. On Twitter. You know her. I freeze. My cheeks warm. I study Rocio's expression, but it looks as sullenly bored as usual. I briefly consider saying never heard of her, but it seems like overcompensating. Yeah. I figured, since you're a Marie Curie stan. You own, like, three pairs of Marie Curie socks. I own seven but I just hum, non-committal. You can tweet at Marie with your problem. She'll retweet and you'll get advice. I ask all the time. Does she? Really? From your professional Twitter? Nah, I make burner accounts. I don't want other people knowing my private business. Why? I complain a lot. About you, for instance. I try not to smile. It's very hard. What did I do? The vegan lean cuisine you always eat at your desk. Yeah? It smells like farts. That night I drag a chair out on the balcony and stare at my depressingly deserted hummingbird feeder, trying to formulate a question as vaguely as possible. At what would Marie do, if she suspected that a collaborator has a vendetta against her and is sabotaging their shared project? When put into words it feels so stupid, I can't even hit send. Instead, I google whether I'm within the age of onset for paranoid ideation, shit. I am, and call Riker to update her on current events. What do you mean, you almost died? Did you see your life replay before your eyes? Did you think of me? Of the cats you never adopted? Of the love you never allow yourself to give? Did you UN fence the bee fence? I'm not sure why I persevere with telling my sister every little humiliating thing that happens to me. My life is mortifying enough without her ruthless commentary. I didn't think about anything. You thought of Marie Curie, didn't you? Riker laughs. Weirdo. How did the Wardas manage to save you? Where did he come from? That's actually a good question. I have no idea how he was able to intervene so quickly. Right place, right time kind of thing, probably. And now you owe him. Your arch nemesis. This is delightful. You're enjoying this way too much. Beach, I spent the day teaching the German dative for 30 euros. I deserve this. I sigh. My hummingbird feeder is still despondently empty, and my heart squeezes. I miss Phineas. I miss the thotchotchks I accumulated in my Bethesda apartment that made it feel like home. I miss Riker, seeing her in person, hugging her, being in the same time zone. I miss knowing where the olives are at the supermarket. I miss doing science. 
I miss the elation I felt during my three days of celebration when I thought Blink would be the opportunity of a lifetime. I miss not having to Google whether I'm having a psychotic episode. Am I crazy? Is Levi really sabotaging me? You're not crazy. If you were, I'd be, too. Jeans and stuff. Knowing Riker, I don't find this reassuring. At all. But as much as he dislikes you, it's hard to believe that he's sabotaging you. That level of hatred requires so much effort and motivation and commitment, it's basically love. I doubt he cares that much. My guess is that he's just being a testicle and not actively helping you. Which is why you should have a calm but firm conversation with him. I sigh again. You're probably right. Probably. I smile. Likely. Hem tell me about astronaut guy. Is astronaut guy cute? He's nice. A.W. Not cute, then. When I go to bed, I'm convinced that Riker is right. I need to be firmer in my demands. I have a plan for next week, if there is no ETA for my equipment by Monday morning, I'm going to civilly confront Levi and tell him to cut the crap. If things get ugly, I'll threaten him with wearing the dress again. It was clearly his kryptonite. I'd be open to doing laundry every night and subjecting him to it for the rest of my stay in Houston. I smile at the ceiling, thinking that being revolting sometimes has its own advantages. I turn around, and when the sheets rustle, I'm almost in a good mood. Cautiously optimistic. Blink will work out, I'll make sure of it. And then Monday happens. 5. Amygdala, anger. It starts with Trevor, my knee boss, wanting to talk as soon as you can, B, which has me groaning into my oatmeal. Neuroscience is a relatively new field, and Trevor is a mediocre scientist who was lucky enough to be at the right place when tons of neuro positions and funding opportunities were created. Fast forward 20 years, and he has made just enough connections to avoid being fired even though I strongly suspect that if given a human brain, he wouldn't be able to point to the occipital lobe. I call him while walking to work, the humid morning air instantly pasting a sticky layer on my skin. His first words are, B, where are you with Blink? Oh, I'm just peachy, thank you. What about you? About to start week two. But where's the project at? He bristles. Are the suits ready? Helmets. They're helmets. Seems like that would be an easy detail to remember, since we study the brain. Whatever, he says impatiently. Are they ready? I miss him so little. I can't wait till Blink makes my CV awesome and I can move to a position that doesn't require acknowledging his existence. They're not. The projected timeline is three months. We haven't even started. A pause. What do you mean, you haven't started? I currently have no equipment. No EEG. No TMS. No computers, not even access to my office. Everything I asked for in my application, weeks ago, has yet to be delivered. What? There are mysterious authorizations that need to be collected. But it's impossible to figure out whose authorizations. Are you serious? My heart beats faster at the indignation in his voice. Trevor sounds mad, do I have an ally? A horrible ally, but a useful one. If he exerts some pressure at higher levels, they'll intervene and Levi won't be able to drag his feet in anymore. Oh my god. Why didn't I just call Trevor on day one? I know, it's stupid, a waste of time, and unprofessional. I'm not sure who can help us fix this situation, but... Then you better figure it the hell out. What have you been doing there for a week, visiting the Space Museum? B, you're not on vacation. I... It's your responsibility to get Blink going. What do you think you were hired for? Right. 
This is why I didn't call Trevor. I have no power or connections here. My liaison is Levi, and whatever I do is. Clearly, whatever you do is not enough. He takes a deep breath. Listen carefully, B. George Kramer called me last night. Kramer is the head of our knee institute, so far removed from my lowly postdoc position that it takes me a moment to place the name. On Friday, he talked with the director of knee and with two members of Congress. The general consensus is that Blink is the kind of project that taxpayers eat up. It mixes astronauts and brains, which market test well among average Americans. They're sexy topics. I recoil. I can never hear Trevor and his smelly breath use the word sexy again. Plus, it's the joint collaboration of two already beloved government agencies. It'll make the current administration look good, and they need to look good. I frown. He has been talking for over a minute and hasn't mentioned science once. I don't see what this means. It means that as of right now there's a lot of scrutiny over Blink. Over your performance. Kramer wants weekly updates, starting today. He wants an update today. And every week from today. Well, this is going to be a problem. What the hell am I supposed to tell him? That I have no progress to report, but will he accept an R-rated list of elaborately intricate murder fantasies I have spun regarding Dr. Levi Ward? I am toying with the idea of turning them into a graphic novel. And, B, Trevor is saying, Kramer doesn't care about attempts. He wants results. Wait a minute. I can give Kramer however many updates he wants. But this is science, not PR. I want results as much as he does, but we're talking about building a piece of equipment that will alter astronauts' brain activity. I'm not going to rush through experiments and make a possibly fatal mistake. Then you're off this project. My jaw drops. I stop in the middle of the crosswalk until a Nissan honks and startles me into running to the sidewalk. What, what did you just say? If you don't get your act together, I'm going to pull you and send someone else. Why? Who? Hank. Or January. Or someone else, you know how long the list is. How many people applied for this position? But that's the point. I got blink because I'm the most qualified, you can't just send someone else. I can if you've been there for an entire week and got nothing done. B, I don't care if you're the best I have at neurostimulation if you don't get it together soon, you're out. By the time I get to the office, my heart is pounding and my head's in chaos. Can Trevor take me off of Blink? No. He can't. Or maybe he can. I have no clue. Shit, of course he can. He can do whatever he wants, especially if he can prove that I'm not doing enough. Which he will be able to do, thanks to Levi Wardas. God, I hate him. My murder fantasies reach their final form, longitudinal impalement. Vlad style. I'll plant the stake right outside my bedroom window. His suffering can be the last thing I see before I sleep and the first when I wake up. I'll sprinkle nectar all over him so the hummingbirds can feast on his blood. Solid plan. Rocio asked for the morning off. I'm alone in the office and free to do what my heart desires, head desk. What are my options here? I need to get a straight answer on when the equipment will be delivered, but I don't know who to ask. Guy will direct me to Levi, Levi won't talk to me, and... I sit up as an idea starts forming in my head. Two minutes later I'm on the phone with Stimcase, the company that produces the system I use. This is Dr. B. Koenigswasser, calling from the Sullivan Discovery Institute, NASA. I wanted to check on the status of our order, it's a TMS system. Of course. The customer service lady's voice is low and soothing. Do you have an order number? Um, not at hand. My, um, assistant is out. But the listed principal investigator should be either me or Dr. Levi Ward. Just a moment, then. 
Oh, yes. Under Dr. Ward's name. But it looks like the order was cancelled. My stomach twists in knots. I tighten my fingers around the phone to avoid dropping it. Could you? I clear my throat. Could you check again? It was supposed to be shipped last Monday, but Dr. Ward cancelled it the previous Friday. The day Levi first saw me in Houston. The day he saved my life. The day he decided that he had no intention of working with me, ever. I. Okay. I nod, even though she can't possibly see me. Thank you. The hang-up noise is deafeningly loud, echoing through my head for long moments. I don't know what to do. What do I do? Shit. Shit. You know who would know what to do? Dr. Curie, of course. But also, Annie. When she was a third year, some guy stole her optic fibers, so she installed a subroutine on his computer that made lobster porn pop up every time he typed the letter X. He almost dropped out of grad school. That night we celebrated by making watermelon sangria and reinventing the macarena on the roof of her apartment building. Of course, what Annie knows or doesn't know is irrelevant. She's not in my life anymore. She's made her choices. For reasons that I'll never understand. And I. B. I set my phone on the table, wipe my sweaty palms over my jeans, and look to the door. Hey, Kaylee. She's wearing a bright pink lace dress that looks the opposite of what I'm feeling. Is Rocio here? She's out. Taking a test. I swallow, my mind still reeling from the phone call. Phone calls. Can I help you with anything? No. I just wanted to ask her if. She shrugs uncomfortably, flushes a little, but then quickly adds, I was surprised you weren't at the meeting this morning. I tilt my head. What meeting? The one with the astronauts. The knots in my stomach tighten. I don't like where this is going. The astronauts. Yeah, the one Levi and Guy organized. For feedback. To brainstorm options for the helmets. It was really useful. When, when was it scheduled for? This morning. 8 a.m. It was set up last week, and. Kaylee's eyes widen. You knew about it, right? I look away and shake my head. This is humiliating. And infuriating. And other things, too. Oh my god. She sounds genuinely distraught. I am so sorry I have no idea how that could happen. I exhale a silent, bitter laugh. I do. Is there anything I can do to fix this? As project manager, I want to apologize. No, I. I paste a smile on my face. It's not your fault, Kaylee. You've been great. I'm tempted to explain to her that her boss has also been great, a great pain in my ass. But I don't want to put her in an uncomfortable position, and I'm not sure I trust myself not to blurt out a string of insults. I sit for a long time after she leaves, staring at the empty desks, the empty chairs, the empty white walls of my supposed office, where I am supposed to do the science that will supposedly launch my career and make a happy, fulfilled woman out of me. I sit until my hands are not shaking and my chest doesn't feel like it's being squeezed by a large hand anymore. Then I stand, take a deep breath, and march straight to Levi's office. I knock, but I don't bother waiting for a response. I open the door, close it behind me, and start speaking as soon as I'm in, my arms folded on my chest. For reasons I cannot discern, I'm smiling. Why? Levi's gaze lifts from his computer screen to me, and his double take is small, but noticeable. He always has the same look in his eyes when he first sees me, a flash of panic. Then he collects himself and his entire face shutters. He should really work on expanding his emotional range. What does he think I'm going to do, anyway? Convert him to Scientology. 
Sell him Avon products. Give him full-blown typhoid. Really, I just want to know why. I'm not even asking you to stop, I just need to know, why. Do I smell like cilantro? Did I steal your parking spot in grad school? Do I remind you of the kid who poured Snapple on your Game Boy when you were about to finish The Legend of Zelda? He blinks at me from his chair and has the audacity to look confused. I have to give it to him, he has giant balls. Likely to compensate for his micro dick. What are you talking about? My smile turns bitter. Levi. Please. I have no idea what you're referring to. But I'm really busy, so. See, I'm not. I'm not busy at all. I haven't been this unbusy since I was on summer break in middle school, but you know that already, so, why? He sits back in his chair. Even half hidden by his desk, his presence is overwhelming. Winter frosty. Snow covered spruces, his eyes. There are things I need to be doing right this moment. Can we schedule a meeting for another time? I laugh softly. Sure. Should I send you an email? That works. I bet. Will it get the same number of answers as the other emails I sent you? He frowns. Of course. Zero, then. He frowns harder. I've answered all your emails. Is that so? I don't believe it for a second. Then maybe it's an email problem. If I were to check my spam folder I'd find a message from you inviting me to this morning's meeting. That's the moment something shifts. The moment Levi realizes that he's going to have to deal with me. He stands, walks around his desk, leans against it. He folds his arms on his chest and regards me calmly for a minute. Look at us. Just two upnamises, casually standing in front of each other in fake relaxed poses while tumbleweeds roll their merry way around us. A modern spaghetti western. I shoot first. So, it's all a big email misunderstanding. He doesn't answer. Just stares somewhere above my right shoulder. It checks out. Emails that should be delivered, aren't. Emails that shouldn't, are. It would explain the one that cancelled the order for my TMS equipment. It probably just sent itself. Vigilante emails going rogue. Oh, Outlook's in trouble. His fake calm is getting less convincing. If you think about it, it's the only possible explanation. Because last week, when I asked you if you had an ETA, you said that we were close. And you would never lie to me, would you? His annoyingly handsome face hardens. Yes, even more than usual. I would not lie to you. He says it in an earnest, pissed off tone, as though it's important to him that I believe him. Ha! Huh. I'm sure you wouldn't. I push away from the door and amble around the office. And you would not single me out to point out a dress code that is obviously never enforced, nor would you make it impossible for me to get into my office without having to beg to be let in. I stop in front of a library shelf. Scattered between the engineering tomes I notice a handful of personal items. They humanize Levi in a way I'm not ready for, a child's drawing of a black cat, a few bobbleheads from sci-fi movies, two framed pictures. One is Levi and another tall, dark-haired man free climbing a rock formation. The other, a woman. Very beautiful. Long, dark blonde hair. Young, probably Levi's age. She smiles at the camera, holding a toddler with a full head of dark curls. The frame is clearly homemade, buttons and shells and sticks glued together. My heart lurches, heavy. I knew he had a child. I've even turned this piece of information around in my head several times since finding out. And I'm not surprised that he's married. He doesn't wear a ring but that doesn't mean anything, I often do wear a ring, and I'm most definitely not married. Honestly, I'm not sure why this hits me so hard. I certainly have no personal stake in Levi's romantic life, 
and I don't usually go about feeling jealous when people find themselves happily paired. But the domesticity that the picture conjures, just like the soft, intimate tone his voice took last week when he answered the call, very clearly, Levi has a home. A place in the world, just for himself. Someone to go back to every night. And on top of that, his career is more stable than mine. Levi Ward, lord of a thousand glares and a million rude nods, belongs. And I don't. The universe is truly not fair. I sigh, defeated, and turn around to face him. Just tell me why, Levi. It's a complicated situation. Is it? Seems pretty simple. He shakes his head, carefully considers what to say, and then somehow lands on the most ridiculous five words I've ever heard. Give me a few days. A few days. Levi, Rocio, and I moved here to work. We left our friends, families, partners in Maryland, and now we're twiddling our thumbs. Then go home for a few days. His tone is harsh. Visit your partner, come back later. That's not the damn point. I aggressively run a hand through my bangs. Riker said that I should confront him calmly, but that horse is out of the stable and galloping around the moors. I'm pretty sure Levi's neighbors can hear me raise my voice, and I'm fully okay with it. I have the head of knee wanting progress reports from me, and my boss threatening to send in someone else if I don't get him results soon. I need my equipment. I'm not asking you to do this for me, do it for the project. I must have moved closer, or maybe he to me, because all of a sudden I can smell him. Pine and soap and clean male skin. Do you even care about Blink? His eyes blaze. I care. Do not ever imply otherwise, he grits out, leaning forward. I've never hated someone this intensely. I never will again. I believe it as deeply as I do cell theory. You sure don't act like you do. You don't know what you're talking about. And you, I step closer, stabbing my finger into his chest, don't know how to run a project. I am asking you to trust me. Trust you? I laugh in his face. Why the hell should I trust you? I stab my finger at him again and this time he closes his palm around it to stop me. Something odd happens. His grip slides down to my palm, and for a moment he's almost holding my hand in his. It makes my skin tingle and my breath catch, his, too. It must be his cue to realize that he's touching me, me, the most abhorrent creature of the seven seas. He lets go immediately, as if burned. I am doing what I can, he begins. Which is nothing. With the resources I have. Oh, come on. And there are things you don't know. Then tell me. Explain. The ensuing silence clinches it for me. The way his jaw tightens, the fact that he straightens and turns abruptly, pacing three steps away as though he is finished with this. With me. You never even started, asshole. Right. Well. I shrug. I'm going to your superior, Levi. He gives me a shocked look. What? Oh, now he is worried. How the worm has turned. How the cookie crumbles. I need to get Blink started. You're leaving me no choice but to go over your head. Over my head? He briefly closes his eyes. There is no such thing. I do you, I sputter. God, this man's ego must have its own gravitational field. He's a human pit stuffed full of dark matter and hubris. Do you even hear yourself? Don't do it, B. Why shouldn't I? Are you going to call Stimcase and get me my equipment? Are you going to get us an office that isn't away from everyone? Are you going to start inviting us to essential meetings? It's not that simple. What an asswipe. But it is. It's pretty damn simple, and if you don't commit to fixing this, you don't get to tell me not to go to your superior. 
You don't want to do that. Is he threatening me? See, I thought so, too. But now I'm pretty sure I do. Watch me. I spin on my heels and head for the door, ready to walk straight to Boris's office, but when my hand is on the knob something occurs to me and I turn around. And one more thing, I snarl into his stony face. Vegan donuts are for vegans, you absolute walnut. Levi can't be too distressed by our conversation, because he doesn't even attempt to come after me. I'm pumped full of rage and want to march to Boris, but I run into Rocio down the hallway. She's dragging her feet, staring vacantly at the floor like an inmate on death row. Even more than usual. I stop. As impatient as I am to get my equipment and ruin a career, I think I love Rocio more than I hate Levi. Though it's a close call. How did the GIE go? The graduate record examination is like the SATS, a stupid standardized test on which students need to get an absurdly high score to be accepted into grad school even though it tests nothing that has to do with academic success. I remember agonizing over my scores in my last year of college, terrified that they wouldn't be high enough to get me into the same programs as Tim. As it turned out, mine were higher than his, and I ended up with several more acceptances than he had. In hindsight, I should have gone to Ukla and left him behind. It would have saved me a lot of heartache and minimized my wardess exposure. B. Rocio shakes her head gloomily. Which way is the ocean? I point to my left. She immediately begins shuffling her feet in that direction. Ro, you first have to get out of the building and what are you doing? I shall walk into the sea. Farewell. Wait. I circle around her. How did it go? She shakes her head again. Her eyes are red-rimmed. Low. How low? Too low. Well, you don't need 99th percentile to get into Johns Hopkins. 40th for quantitative. 52nd for verbal. Okay. That is low. And you can always retake. For 200 bucks. And it's my third time I don't get any better, no matter how much I practice. It's like I'm jinxed. She stares into the distance. Is it La Llorona? Does she want me to quit academia and haunt creeks with her? Perhaps I should depart my scientific pursuits. No. I'll help you get your scores up, okay? How? Will you cast a counterspell? Will you promise her your firstborn and the blood of one hundred virgin ravens? What? No. I'll tutor you. Tutor me? She scowls. Can you even do math? I don't point out that my entire body of work consists of high-level statistics applied to the study of the brain, and instead pull her in for a hug. It'll be okay, I promise. What's happening? Why are you squeezing me with your body? The entire conversation lasts less than 10 minutes, but it proves to be a fatal mistake. Because by the time I'm on the mostly deserted third floor of the building, standing outside Boris's office and ready to rut Levi out within an inch of his life, the door is closed, and I can hear voices inside. And one of those voices is Levi Ward's. 6. Heschel's gyrus, here, here. I cannot believe he got to Boris before I could. I cannot believe he sneaked past me while I was talking with Rocio. Though I absolutely should, since it's the exact kind of dick move I've come to expect from him. I actually stomp my foot like a surly six-year-old. That's what I've been reduced to. What do I do? Do I barge in and stop Levi from poisoning Boris's mind with lies? Do I wait for Levi to get out and focus on damage control? Do I curl into a ball and cry? Dr. Curie would know what to do. Dr. Koenigswasser, on the other hand, is looking around like a lost calf, grateful that there's no one around to see her sulking outside the director of research's office. When I decided to become a scientist, 
I figured I'd grapple with theoretical framework issues, research protocols, statistical modeling. Instead here I am, living my best high school life. And then I realize I can make out some words. Unprofessional, Levi is saying. I agree, Boris replies. And not conducive to scientific progress. He sounds calmly exasperated, which should be technically impossible, but Levi does have a knack for bringing oxymorons to life. The situation is unsustainable. I fully agree. You've said that every time we've talked before, but I doubt you understand how catastrophic the long-term repercussions can be for Blink, for NIH, and for NASA. And this is unpleasant on an interpersonal level, too. I lean closer to the door, white-knuckled. I cannot believe he's feeding Boris this crap. I am unpleasant to him. How? By being offensive to look at. I'm about to slam the door open to defend myself when he continues, she cannot continue like this. Something must be done. Oh my god. Am I trapped in a bizarro dimension? Okay. What would you have me do with her? I'm going to screech. Whatever Levi says, it's going to make me yell with rage. I'm already vibrating with an UN screamed howl. It's rising up my throat. I want you to let her do her job. Up and up and up my larynx, through my vocal box, and wait. What? What did Levi say? I've done as much as I can. Boris is faintly apologetic. Levi, on the other hand, is hard and uncompromising. It's not enough. I need her to have authorized access to every Blink-related area in the building, to have a NASA.government email address, to attend project meetings. I need every single piece of equipment she asked for to be here now, it should have arrived ages ago. You're the one who cancelled the order that was placed. Because it wasn't the system she asked for. Why would I blow a chunk of our budget on an inferior product? Levi, just like I told you every single day you've come to me with this last week, sometimes it's not about science, it's about politics. I am fully leaning my ear and palms against the door now. My fingers shake against the wood, but I don't feel them. I'm numb. Politics is above my pay grade, Boris. Not above mine. We've been over this, things have changed a lot, and very quickly. The director was on board with a new NASA collaboration as long as NASA got credit and autonomy on the project. Then NIH insisted on having a larger role. NASA can't have it. NASA must have it. The director is under lots of pressure. The possible ramifications are huge if we patent the technology, there's no telling how widely it can be applied and what the revenue might be. He doesn't want me to own half of the patent. A pause, brimming with frustration. I can almost picture Levi running a hand through his hair. NASA doesn't have the budget to do the project alone, that's why me was brought in to begin with. Are you telling me that they'd rather have Blink not happen at all than share the credit? And who will be in charge of the neuroscience portion? Dr. Koenigswasa is not the only neuroscientist in the world. We have several at NASA who are not nearly as good as her, not when it comes to neurostimulation. This is a bizarro world. More bizarre than I could ever imagine. I'm in the upside down, my heart thudding in my ears, and Levi Ward just said something nice about me. A cold, slimy feeling coils in the pit of my stomach. I might throw up, except that I'm completely hollow. I was full of rage when I came here, but that's draining. We'll make do. Levi, Blink will be moved to the next budget review, and by then NASA will approve full funding. That way we won't need any. You'll still be in charge. That's a year from now, and you can't guarantee that. Just like you can't guarantee that the Sullivan prototype will be used. A pause. Son, I understand this is important to you. I feel the same, but... I doubt it. Excuse me. 
Levi's voice could cut titanium. I seriously doubt you feel the same. Levi. If you do, authorize the equipment purchase. A sigh. Levi, I like you. I really do. You're a smart guy. One of the best engineers I know may be the best. But you're young and have no idea about the pressure everyone's under. Blink's unlikely to happen this year. Better make peace with it. Seconds pass. I can't hear Levi's reply, so I lean in even farther, which turns out to be a terrible idea, because the door swings open. I jump back quickly enough that Boris doesn't see me, but when Levi steps outside I'm still standing right there, by the office. He slams the door and begins stalking away angrily. Then he notices me and freezes. He looks furious. And big. Furiously big. I should say something. Play it cool. Make it seem like I only just wandered here, looking for the office supply closet. Oh, Levi, do you know where they keep the pencil sharpeners? Problem is, that ship has long sailed, and while we study each other with equally raw expressions, I experience an odd, transient feeling. Like this is the first time Levi sees me. No, not quite, like this is the first time I see him. Like the elaborate maze of mirrors through which we've been looking at each other has been shattered, the shards swept away. I can't bear it. I lower my gaze to my feet. Thankfully, the feeling dissolves as I stare at the pretty daisies on my faux leather sandals. My fingers need to quit shaking or I'll chop them off. If my tear ducks dare to let even a single drop slip through, I'll tie them shut forever. I'm almost ready to look up again without making a fool of myself, when a large hand closes firmly around my elbow. Shouldn't have worn a sleeveless top today. What are you? Levi lifts one finger to his lips to signal me to be quiet and leads me away from the office. Where I start, but he interrupts me with a low whisper. Hush. His grip is gentle but tight around my flesh. I'm dismayed to find that it seems to help with my nausea. Without having a clue of what to do, I close my eyes and follow his lead. I'm a slow processor. Always have been. When my nonna died, everyone around me had been sobbing for several minutes by the time I finally passed what the white-haired doctor was saying. When Riker decided to take a gap decade to go travel the world, I didn't realize how lonely I'd be until she was on a plane to Indonesia. When Tim moved out of our apartment, the implications only hit me several days later, the moment I found two of his mismatched socks still in the dryer. Probably why the enormity of what I heard outside Boris's office doesn't fully dawn on me until I'm on one of the benches in the little picnic area behind the Discovery building, elbows on my knees and forehead in my hands. It's such a lovely spot. The shades of two cedar elms and a live oak cross right where I'm sitting. I need to eat lunch out here from now on, I think. Then my lean cuisine won't stink up the office. My stomach twists. There might not be an on from this now. Are you okay? I glance up, and up, and up. Levi is standing in front of me, still icily furious but more in control. Like he counted to ten to calm down a bit, but would gladly go back to one and flip a desk or three. There's a hint of concern in his eyes, and for some reason I'm thinking again of him pinning me to the wall, of the smell of his skin, the feeling of his hard muscles under my fingers. There's something very wrong with my brain. I double-checked, he murmurs. I received seven emails from you, and all my replies were sent. I'm not sure why they didn't deliver. I'm assuming the same happened to the one guy sent to invite you to today's meeting and I take responsibility for it. You should have a NASA email address by now. The weather outside is perfectly nice, but I'm cold and sweaty at the same time. What a complex organism, my body. Why? I ask. I'm not even sure what I'm referring to. He exhales slowly. How much did you hear? I don't know. A lot. He nods. 
NASA wants exclusive control of whatever patent comes out of Blink. But it currently doesn't have the budget to pull off the project, and there was some arm twisting to include NIH. But NIH is insisting on co-owning the patent, and NASA decided that letting Blink die a natural death is better than picking a fight with NIH. And this is it. The natural death. He doesn't answer, simply continuing to study me with worry and something else, something I can't quite put my finger on. It's unsettling, and I nearly laugh when I realize why, this is the first time Levi has sustained eye contact with me for more than a second. The first time his eyes don't flit away to some point above my head right after meeting mine. I turn away. I'm not in the mood for ice cream. What if I told NIH? A brief hesitation. You could. But. No buts. It'd be fully within your rights. I'll support you, if you need me to. But. I look at him. There are small scratches on his hand, hairs dust his forearm, his shirt stretches across his shoulder. He's so imposing from this angle, even more than usual. What did they feed him growing up, fertilizer? If you told NIH, the only outcome I can imagine is knee pulling out and the relationship between me and the human research branch of NASA souring. Blink would be shelved until... Until next year. And it would still be a NASA-only project. Either way, I'm screwed. Catch-22. Never liked that novel. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, he says carefully, but if the endgame is to make Blink happen as a collaborative project, it might not be the best move. Not to mention that I'd need to get Trevor to believe that this isn't my fault. Seems like I'd have better luck just telling him that NASA has been taken over by shape-shifting aliens. Yeah, I'll try that. Might as well. What's the alternative? I ask. I see none. I've been working on it. How? I think having Boris on our side would help immensely. And there are things that I might be able to leverage to persuade him. And how are those things working out for you? He gives me a dirty look, but there's no real heat behind it. Not great. Yet, he grumbles. No shit, Sherlock. Basically, I'm the only person in the world who wants Blink to happen now. He frowns. I want it, too. I remember his earlier anger, when I accused him of not caring. God, that was probably less than an hour ago. Feels like nine decades. And so do other people. The engineers, the astronauts, contractors who'd be out of a job if it were postponed. His broad shoulders seem to deflate a bit. Though you and I seem to be the highest ranking people on board. Which is why we need Boris. It sounds like if you sit tight for a few months the project will fall in your lap and. No. He shakes his head. Blink has to happen now. If it's delayed there's a chance that I won't be in charge, or that the original prototype will be modified. He sounds so uncompromising, I wonder if this is his pick up your toys and go to bed dad voice. It sure seems effective. If I end up having kids, I hope I can pull off something this authoritative. Still, you'll be fine no matter what. I can't keep the bitterness out of my tone. While NIH is making personnel cuts, and the main criterion is successfully completed grants. Which I don't have because of reasons, reasons that have little to do with me not trying or not being a good scientist, which I am, I promise I am good at this, Anne. I know you are, he interrupts. He sounds sincere. And this project is not just another assignment for me. I transferred teams to be here. I pulled strings. I run a hand down my face. What a dumpster fire. You could have told me that NASA was roadblocking. Instead of letting me believe that you were. He looks at me blankly. That I was. You know. Trying to oust me for the usual reasons. The usual reasons? Yeah. I shrug. From grad school. 
What reasons from grad school? Just the fact that you, you know. I'm not sure I do. I scratch my forehead, exhausted. That you despise me. He gives me an astonished look, like I just coughed up a hairball. Like the person who avoided me like I was a flesh-eating porcupine was his evil twin. He's speechless for a moment, and then says, somehow managing to sound honest, B. I don't despise you. Wow. Wow, for so many reasons. The blatant lie, for instance, like he doesn't consider me the human equivalent of gas station sushi, but also, this is the first time Levi has used my name. I haven't kept track or anything, but there's something so uniquely him in the way he says the word, I could never forget. Right. He keeps staring at me with the same disoriented, earnest expression. I snort and smile. I guess I must have misread every single one of our grad school interactions, then. He did tell Boris I'm a good neuroscientist, so maybe he doesn't think I'm incompetent like I always suspected. Maybe he just hates literally everything else about me. Lovely. You know I don't despise you, he insists with a hint of accusation. Sure I do. B. He says my name again, with that voice, and all I see is red. But of course I know. How could I not know when you've been so relentlessly cold, arrogant, and unapproachable? I stand, anger bubbling up my throat. For years you have avoided me, refused to collaborate with me without valid reasons, denied me even minimally polite conversation, treated me as though I was repulsive and inferior, you even told my fiancé that he should marry someone else, but of course you don't despise me, Levi. His Adam's apple bobs. He stares at me like that, stricken, disconcerted, like I just hit him with a polo mallet, when all I've done is tell the truth. My eyes sting. I bite my lip to keep the tears at bay, but my stupid body betrays me once again and I'm crying, I'm crying in front of him, and I hate him. I'm not mad at him, I hate him. For the way he's treated me. For having the solid career I don't. For concealing the politics of this damn septic tank of a project. I hate him, hate him, hate him, with a passion I thought I could only reserve for defective airbags, or Tim or the third move of the year. I hate him for reducing me to this, and for sticking around to see his handiwork. I hate him. And I don't want to feel so much. B. This is not worth it. I wipe my cheek with the back of my hand and walk past without looking at him. Of course he has to be massive and make that hard, too. Wait. I'll tell me about what's happening. I say without stopping or turning back. I can't risk my superiors thinking that the project failed because of me. I'm sorry if that puts you in a bad position, and I'm sorry if that means delaying blink. That's okay. But please, wait. No. I don't want to wait, or to listen to even one more word. I keep on walking in my pretty daisy sandals until I can't hear him anymore, until I can't see through the blur of my tears. I walk out of the space center and fantasize that I'm leaving Houston, Texas, the United States. I fantasize about getting on a plane and flying to Portugal to get a hug from Riker. I fantasize all the way home, and it doesn't make me feel any better. I'm staring at my phone, just that, brooding and staring at my phone when a Twitter notification pops up on my screen. At Sobrarock's 95 second year geology PhD student going through a rough patch, here. At what would Marie do if she felt like the universe is trying to tell her to give up? Ouch. This one hits a little too close. My sense of helplessness reached critical mass earlier today, halfway through Alanis Morissette's discography and well past my second tub of orange sherbet. I feel like I was run through a paper shredder. Like a used Q tip a flushable wipe. Not fit to give advice to the moth that's been fluttering against my window, let alone an intelligent young woman with career trouble. I retweet, hoping that the WWMD community will take care of at Sobro Rocks 95. Maybe I should quit academia, 
I muse, leaning back in my chair, staring across the open plan kitchen to Dr. Curie's magnet. Should I quit my job? Marie doesn't reply. Silent approval. There are things I could do. Brush up on the German accusative and meet Riker in Greece, where olive oil tycoons would hire us to instruct their teenage heirs. Shop that sitcom idea I once had, a Bayesian statistician and a frequentist become reluctant roommates. Write my mermaid YA series. Move under a bridge and ask riddles in exchange for safe passage. Maybe I shouldn't quit. At least one Koenigswasser twin needs a stable job, to post bail when the other gets arrested for indecent exposure. Knowing Riker, that's any day now. Then again, I'm fairly sure that without Blink, Trevor won't renew my contract anyway. My career is the ultimate unrequited love story, littered with well-reviewed grants that never got funded for political reasons, a shitty boss instead of the rock star I was promised, and now me and NASA petifighting like cousins at Thanksgiving. When your supposed big break turns into a losing game, that's when you cut your losses, right? But what would be left of me without neuroscience? Who would I even be without my burning need to correct people who say that humans use only 10% of their brain? They even made a movie about this. For fuck's sake, does no one fact check Hollywood scripts? Did you know that conservatives tend to have larger amygdala than liberals? That taxi drivers hippocampi grow bigger as they memoize how to navigate London? That brain differences predict variations in personality? We are our nervous systems, the complex combination of billions of neurons firing in distinctive patterns. What's more exciting than spending my life figuring out what a little chunk of these neurons can accomplish? I avoid my reflection as I brush my teeth. Maybe I love what I do too much. I should go back to school for something boring. Auctioneering. Naval architecture. Sports broadcasting. I should also stop crying. Or maybe not. Maybe I should feel all my feelings now, so I can be solution-oriented later. All wept out for tomorrow, when I explain this mess to Trevor. When I tell Rocio to pack her bags. The second my head touches my pillow I know I'll explode if I don't do something. Anything. On impulse, I message Schmack. Marie, do you ever think of leaving research? His reply is immediate. SHMAC, sure I'm today. Marie, you hate your life, too? What are the chances? SHMAC, maybe we're the same astrological sign. Marie, lol. SHMAC, what's going on? Marie, my project's a shitshow. And I'm working with this total camel dick who's the worst. I bet he's one of those assholes who doesn't switch to airplane mode during takeoff, schmack. He probably bites into popsicles. I'm positive he sneezes in his palm and then shakes people's hands. SHMAC, eerily specific. Marie, but true. SHMAC, I don't doubt it. Marie, how's the girl? SHMAC, still married. Plus, she probably thinks I'm a camel dick. Marie, she could never. You two having a torrid affair yet? SHMAC, the opposite. Marie, did she at least get ugly while she was gone? SHMAC, she's still the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. My heart skips a beat. Oh, schmack. SHMAC, that aside, I've been thinking about how much easier my life would be if I quit and became a cat trainer. Except, I can't even convince my cat not to piss under my living room carpet. Marie, I can see how that would be an issue. Marie, do you ever feel like we put too much of ourselves into this? SHMAC, on the bad days, for sure. Marie, are there good days? Ever? SHMAC, my last one was in middle school. Second place at the science fair. Marie, did you win a Toys R Us gift certificate? 
SHMAC, nope. A Marie Curie bobblehead, holding two beakers that glow in the dark. Marie, OMG. I would murder for that. SHMAC, if we ever meet in person, it's yours. We chat for a long time, and it's nice to commiserate while it lasts, but once I set my phone on the nightstand I feel hopeless again. The last thing I see before falling asleep is Levi's stricken expression when I threw at him all the things he did to me, painted on the back of my eyelids like the poster of a movie I never want to watch again. 7. Orbitofrontal cortex, hope. MY alarm rings, but I let it snooze. Once. Twice. Three times, five, eight, twelve, why the hell is it still ringing, why did I even set it? B. I open my eyes. Barely. They're bleary, sticky with sleep. B. Crap. I inadvertently answered a call from an unknown number. Shish shish, -shi, I slur. Then I spit out my retainer. Sorry, this is she. I need you to come in right now. I instantly recognize the baritone. Levi? I blink at my alarm. It's 6.43 a.m. I can't keep my lids up. What? Come where? Can you be in Boris's office by 7? That makes me sit up in bed. Or as close as I can manage at this hour. What are you talking about? Do you want to stay and work on Blink? His voice is firm. Decisive. I can hear background noise. He must be outside, walking somewhere. What? Have you told me about what NASA is doing yet? Not yet, but... Then do you want to stay and work on Blink? I press my palm into my eye. This is a nightmare, right? I thought we agreed that's not an option. It might be now. I have a something. A pause. A bit of a gamble though. What is it? Something that'll get Boris to support us. He cuts off for a second. Can't explain on the phone. It sounds sketchy. Like he's trying to lure me to a secondary location to traffic me to people who'll harvest my femurs to make handles for badminton rackets. Can't we just meet later? No. Boris is having a call with the NASA director in one hour we need to catch him before then. I run a hand over my face. I'm way too pooped for this. Levi, this sounds very weird and I just woke up. If you're trying to get me alone to assassinate me, could we just go ahead, pretend you did it, and go our separate ways? Listen. What you said yesterday. He must have stepped inside, because the background noise is gone. His voice is rich and deep in my ear. I think I can actually hear him swallow. There is no other neuroscientist I'd want to do this project with. Not a single one. It's a blow to the sternum. The words knock the air out of my lungs, and a weird, nonsensical, untimely thought crosses my mind, it's not that surprising that this broody, reserved man snagged himself a beautiful bride. Not if he's capable of saying things like this. At least I'm awake now. What's happening? B, do you want to stay in Houston and work on Blink, he asks again, but this time after a pause he adds, with me. That's when I know that I'm a lunatic. Insane. An utterly insane lunatic. Because my alarm says 6.45am, and a shiver runs down my spine or where my spine would be if I had one. I screw my eyes shut, and the word that comes out of my mouth is, yeah. I stumble out of the elevator two minutes past seven, energized by a night of restful sleep and dressed for success. Just kidding. I'm wearing leggings and a flannel shirt, I forgot to put on a bra, and having to choose between brushing my teeth and washing my face I went for the former, which means that when Levi spots me I'm frantically trying to scrape sleep boogers from my eyes. I feel jittery and drowsy, the worst possible combination. Levi is waiting by Boris's office, put together like it's not the middle of the night, 
and knocks on the door the moment he sees me. I break into a light jog, and by the time I get there I'm also sweaty and out of breath. My life is so lovely. As lovely as a spinal tap. What is going on? No time to explain. But like I said, it's a gamble. Pretend you already know when we're in there. I frown. Know what? Boris yells at us to come in. Just follow my lead, Levi says, gesturing me inside. We're supposed to be co-leads, I mutter. The corner of his lip twitches up. Follow my co-lead, then. Please, tell me this mess doesn't end in a murder-suicide. He opens the door and shrugs, ushering me in with a hand between my shoulder blades. Guess we'll see. Boris had no idea we'd show up. His eyes roll and narrow, a mix of I'm tired and not you too and I don't have time for this, and he stands from behind his desk with his hands on his hips. I take a step back. What is this car crash of a meeting? What did I get myself into? And why, oh why did I ever think that trusting Levi Ward would be a good idea? No, Boris says, Levi, I'm not going to go over this again, and not in front of a knee employee. I have a meeting that I need to prep for, so. The annoyance in his voice fades as Levi, unruffled, sets his phone on the desk. There's a picture on the screen, but I can't make out what it is. I push up on my toes and lean forward to see, but Levi pulls on the back of my flannel and lifts one eyebrow, which I believe means you're supposed to follow my lead. I frown in my best sure would be nice to know what's going on, but whatever. When I glance at Boris, there's a deep horizontal line in the middle of his forehead. Did you make some changes to the helmet prototype? I don't remember authorizing. I did not. This doesn't look like what I approved. It's not. Levi holds out his hand, and when Boris returns the phone, he pulls up another picture. A person, wearing something on their head. The line on Boris's brow deepens even more. When was the picture taken? That, I'd rather not say. Boris's gaze sharpens. Levi, if you're making this up because of yesterday's conversation. The name of the company is Magtech. They are very well established, based in Rotterdam, and do science tech. They've been open about the fact that they're working on wireless neurostimulation helmets. A pause. They have a fairly long history of supplying armed forces and militias with combat gadgets. Which armed forces? Whoever can pay. How far ahead are they? Based on those blueprints and on my contacts information, pretty much where Blink's at. He holds Boris's eyes a little too intensely. At least, where Blink was at. Before it was shelved. Boris risks a quick glance at me. Technically, the project was never shelved, he says defensively. Technically. There is something commanding about the way Levi talks, even to his boss. Boris flushes and returns the phone. I pluck it from Levi's hand before he can pocket it and study the pictures. It's a neurostimulation helmet, the blueprints and the prototype. Not quite ours, but similar. Scarily similar. Oh shit we have competition similar. Do they know about Blink? Boris is asking. Unclear. But they wouldn't have seen our prototype. They don't have a neuroscientist on their team. Not a good one, I add distractedly. How do you know that? Boris asks. I shrug. Well, it's pretty obvious. They're making the same mistake Levi is, the output locations. Honestly, why can't engineers ever be bothered to consult with experts outside of their discipline? Is it part of vector calculus? First rule of engineering, do not display weakness. Never ask questions. Better to finish a wrong, unusable prototype on your own than to collaborate with I look up, notice the way Boris and Levi are staring at me, and slap my mouth shut. I really shouldn't be allowed in public before coffee. Point is, 
I say after clearing my throat, they're not doing so hot, and as soon as they start trying out the helmet in action they'll realize it. I give Levi's phone back, and his fingers brush mine, rough and warm. Our eyes meet for a split second, then flit away. The blueprint, Boris says. And the picture. Where did you get them? That's not important. Boris's eyes go dinner plate wide. Please, tell me my lead engineer didn't just jeopardize his career by engaging in some light industrial espionage. Boris, Levi interrupts him, this changes things. We need to be working on Blink. Now. Those helmets are conceptually similar to ours. If Magtech gets to a working prototype and patents the tech before we do, we'll have flushed millions of dollars down the toilet. And there's no telling what they'll do with their design. Who they'll sell it to. Boris closes his eyes and scratches his forehead. It must be the sign of weariness Levi was waiting for, because he adds, B and I are here. Ready. We can finish this project in three months if we have the necessary equipment. We can see this through. Boris doesn't open his eyes. The opposite, he scrunches them shut, as though he hates every second of this. Can you really? Get this done in three months. Levi turns to me. I honestly have no idea. Science doesn't work like that. It doesn't do deadlines or consolation trophies. You can design the perfect study, sleep one hour a night, feed on nothing but despair and lean cuisine for months on end, and your results can still be the opposite of what you were hoping to find. Science doesn't give a shit. Science is reliable in its variability. Science does whatever the fuck it wants. God, I love science. But I smile brilliantly. Of course we can. And much better than those Dutch guys. Okay. Okay. Boris runs a hand through his hair, harried. I have a meeting with the director in, damn, ten minutes. I'll push for this. I'll be in touch later today, but yeah. Things are different, with this. He gives Levi a part irritated, part exhausted, part admiring look. I suppose I owe you my congratulations on bringing Blink back from the dead. My stomach somersaults. Holy shit. Holy shit. This is happening after all. If I convince the director, there's no margin of error. You'll have to make the best neurostimulation helmets in the damn world. Levi and I exchange a long glance and nod at the same time. When we step out of the office, Boris is swearing softly. I'm mildly terrified by this turn of events. If we do get the go-ahead, everyone and their mother will be breathing down our necks. The honchos at NASA and me will vulture circle on top of us. I'm going to have to explain to some creationist white guy on his 12th Senate term that brain stimulation is not the same thing as acupressure. Oh, who am I kidding? I wouldn't even mind it for a chance to actually work on Blink and fix all those stubborn engineers' mistakes. A chance that seemed long gone less than an hour ago, but now. I press a hand against my lips, exhaling a laugh. It's going to happen. Well, it's probably going to happen. But NASA's supposed to be chock full of geniuses who'll get us to Mars, no. They won't be so stupid to block the project, not if it's a now or never situation. I have no idea how Levi did it, but. Levi. I look up and there he is, staring at me with a soft smile as I grin into the ether like an idiot. I should snap at him to look away, but when our eyes meet I only want to grin more. We stand like that for several seconds, smiling moronically outside Boris's office, until his expression goes serious. B. What is it about the way he says my name? The pitch? His deep voice? Something else altogether? About yesterday. I shake my head. No. I. God, this apology is going to be painful. Humiliating, too. The colonoscopy of apologies. Better get it over with. Listen, you should have been more forthcoming about what was going on, 
but I probably shouldn't have called you a boob. Or a walnut. I'm not sure what was in my head and what I actually said out loud but. I'm sorry about coming to your office and insulting you. There. Done. Colonoscopy's over. My intestines are sparkling clean. Except that Levi doesn't even acknowledge my apology. What you said, about me despising you. About things that I have done, I. No, I was out of line. I mean, it's all true, but I take a deep breath. Listen, you have every right not to like me as long as you deal with it professionally. Even though, let's be real, what's wrong with you? I'm an absolute delight. I give him an impish grin, but he doesn't get that I'm teasing, because he stares at me with a toned-down version of yesterday's stricken expression. Oops. I rock on my heels and clear my throat. Sorry. Just kidding. I know there's plenty to dislike about me and you are, you, while I am, yeah. Me very different. I know we're nemesis of sorts, nemeses. Nemesis? Anyway, I got upset because I thought you were letting that dictate your behavior on Blink. But clearly that's not the case, so I apologize for assuming, and feel free to carry on. I manage a mostly sincere. Smile. As long as you're civil and fair at work, you can dislike away. Loathe me up. Abhor me to the moon. Detest me into the unknown. I really mean it. Not that I relish the idea of him hating me, but it's such a great improvement over yesterday, when I thought that his dislike would ruin my career, that I'm coming to peace with this. Sort of. Did you. Actually engage in industrial espionage? No. Maybe. A friend knows someone who works for Levi closes his eyes. B. You don't understand. I cock my head. What don't I understand? I don't dislike you. Right. Aha. Uh -huh. So you've been acting like an ass to me for seven years because. He sighs, his broad chest moving up and down. There's a tuft of fur on the sleeve of his shirt. Does he have a pet? He looks like a dog person. Maybe it's his daughter's dog. Because I am an ass. An idiot, too. Levi, it's fine. I understand, really. When we lived in France, my sister loved this classmate of ours, Inns, and I could not stand her. I wanted to pull her braid for no reason. I actually did, once, which was, unfortunate, because my French aunt believed in sending kids to bed without dinner. I shrug. Levi is pinching the bridge of his nose, probably shocked by how much I ramble when I'm still half asleep. One more thing for him to hate about me, I guess. The point is, sometimes dislike is a gut reaction. Like falling in love at first sight, you know. Just, the opposite. His eyes spring open. B. He swallows. I. Levi. Here you are. Kaylee is walking toward us, an iPad in her hand. I wave at her, but Levi doesn't stop staring. At me. I need your approval on two items, and you and Guy have a meeting with Jonas in. Levi? He is, for unknown reasons, still staring at me. And the stricken expression is back. Do I have a sleep booger on my nose? Levi? Third time must be the charm, because he finally looks away. Hey, Kaylee. They start talking and I walk away with another wave, daydreaming about coffee and a bra. I don't know why I turn around one last time, right before stepping into the elevator. I really don't know why, but Levi is looking at me again. Even though Kaylee is still talking. It's TWOPM, I'm wearing a bra, yes, a sports bra is a real bra, no, I do not accept constructive criticism, and sipping my 11th coffee of the day when I get a text from Levi. B, I'm using text since emails are unreliable. Your equipment and computers will be here tomorrow. Let's schedule a meeting to go over Blink at your earliest convenience. 
Kaylee will be there shortly to set you up with NASA.government email, so that you can access our servers. Let me know what else you need. I can't help myself. I must have learned nothing in the past weeks, because I do it again, I shoot off my chair and jump up and down, screeching loudly and joyously in the middle of the office. It's happening. It's happening. It's happening, it's happening, it's. Um. B. I whirl around. Rocio is blinking at me from her desk, alarmed. Sorry. I flush and quickly sit back down. Sorry. Just, good news. The dictator of veganism released you from his tyrannical clutches and you can finally eat real food. What? No. Have you been able to reserve a cemetery plot close to Marie Curie's? That would be impossible, as her ashes are enshrined in the Paris Pantheon and I shake my head. Our equipment is coming. Tomorrow? She actually smiles. Where's a digital camera when you need it? For real? Yes. And Kaylee's on her way to set us up with NASA.government addresses, where are you going? I notice her panicky expression as she stuffs her laptop in her bag. Home. But. Since the computers will be here tomorrow, there's no point in staying. But we can still. She's gone before I can remind her that I'm her boss, I will learn to exert authority, but today's not the day. I don't mind too much anyway. Because when the door closes behind her, I spring out of my chair again and jump up and down a little bit more. 8. Precentral gyrus, movement. Fun fact, Dr. Curie's BFF was an engineer. Seems unlikely, huh? I sit across from the best and brightest of Levi's team, total cockcluster, naturally, and think, who would voluntarily spend time with the engineering ilk? And yet it's true, like turkey-flavored candy corn, pimple-popping videos, and many other unlikely things. It's painful even to think about it, but here goes my least favorite Marie fact, after Pierre died, she started seeing a strapping young physicist named Paul Langevin. Honestly, it's what she deserved. My girl was a young widow who spent most of her time stomping on uranium or like it was wine grapes. We can all agree that if she wanted to get laid, the only adequate response should have been, where would you like your mattress placed, Madame Curie? Right? Wrong. The press got a hold of the gossip and crucified her for it. They treated her like she'd boarded a train to Sarajevo and assassinated Franz Ferdinand herself. They whined about the lamest things, Madame Curie is a homewrecker, Paul had separated from his wife ages before, Madame Curie is tarnishing Pierre's good name, Pierre was probably high-fiving her from physics heaven, which is full of atheist scientists and apple trees for Newton and his buddies to sit under, Madame Curie is five years older than almost forty-year-old Paul, gasp, and therefore a cradle robber, double gasp. If there is one thing men hate more than a smart woman, it's a smart woman who makes her own choices when it comes to her own sex life. It was a whole thing, lots of sexist, anti-Semitic crap was written, pistol duels were held, the words Polish scum were used, and Dr. Curie plunged into a deep depression. But that's where the engineer BFF comes in. Her name was Hertha Ayrton and she was a bit of a polymath. Think of your high school friend who always got straight A's but was also the captain of the soccer team did lights for the drama club, and moonlighted as a suffragette leader. Hertha's famous for studying electric arcs, lightning, but way cooler. I like to fantasize about her using her scientific knowledge to burn Marie's enemies to a crisp, zoo style, but the truth is that their mutual love and support mostly translated into vacationing together to escape the French press. Sometimes friendship is made of quiet little moments and doesn't involve lethal lightning bolts. Disappointing, I know. Then again, other times friendship is made of betrayal, and heartache, and spending two years trying to forget that you blocked the number of someone whose takeout orders you used to have memeized. Anyway. The moral of this particular story is, I believe, that engineers are not all bad. 
But the ones I'm attempting to collaborate with are often stabbable. Like now, for example. I have Mark, the materials guy on Blink, looking me in the eye and telling me for the third time in two minutes, impossible. Okay. Let's try again. If we don't move the output channels farther apart. Impossible. Four. Four times in. Welp. Still two minutes. I take a deep breath, remembering a technique my old therapist used. I saw her for a short time after Tim and I broke up, when my self-confidence was six feet under, partying it up with disgruntled grubs and Mesozoic fossils. She taught me the importance of letting go of what I cannot control, others, and focusing on what I can, my reactions. She'd often do this crafty little thing, reframe my own statements to help me achieve self-realization. Time to therapize Mark the Material Engineer. I understand that I'm asking you to do something that is currently impossible, given the inner shell of the helmet. I smile encouragingly. But maybe, if I explain what needs to be done from a neuroscience perspective, we can find a way to achieve a middle ground. Impossible. I don't head desk, but only because Levi happens to enter the room right at that moment, nodding his good morning in our general direction and rolling up the sleeves of his Henley. His forearms are strong and insanely attractive, and why the hell am I even noticing them? Arg. Kaylee let us know he'd be late because of something at Penny's school. Which, I guess, is the name of his daughter. Because Levi has a daughter. I promise I'll stop repeating this fact as soon as it becomes less shocking to me, i.e., never. Everyone greets him, and I feel a jolt to my stomach. We've been emailing, but we haven't talked in person since yesterday, when I gave him official permission to abhor me as long as he's professional about it. I'm curious to see how he'll play. In deference to his tender sensibilities I'm wearing my tiniest septum ring and the single and tailored dress I own. It's an olive branch, he damn better appreciate it. I see what you're saying, I tell Mark. There are physical impossibilities inherent to the materials, but we might be able to. He repeats the only word he knows. Impossible. Find a solution that. No. I'm about to praise the sudden variety in his vocabulary when Levi interjects. Let her finish, Mark. He takes a seat next to me. What were you saying, B? Huh? What's happening? The, um, the issue is the output's placement. They need to be positioned differently if we want to stimulate the intended region. Levi nods. Like the angular gyrus. I flush. Come on, I apologized for that. I glare at him for shading me in front of his team but I notice an odd gleam in his eyes, as though he... Wait. It's not possible. He's not teasing me, is he? Why yes, I stammer, lost. Like the angular gyrus. And other brain regions, too. And what I told her, Mark says with all the petulance of a six-year-old who's too short for the roller coaster, is that given the property of the Kevlar blend we're using for the inner shell, the distance between outputs needs to stay the way it is. Actually, what he told me was impossible. I'm about to point that out when Levi says, then we change the Kevlar blend. It seems to me like a perfectly reasonable avenue to explore, but the other five people at the table seem to think it's as controversial as the concept of gluten in the 21st century. Murmurs rise. Tongues cluck. A guy whose name might be Fred gasps. That would be a significant change, Mark whines. It's unavoidable. We need to do proper neurostimulation with the helmets. But that's not what the Sullivan prototype calls for. This is the second time I've heard the Sullivan prototype mentioned, and the second time a dense silence ensues when it's brought up. The difference today is that I'm in the room, and I can see how everyone looks to Levi uneasily. Is he the main author of the prototype? Can't be, since he's new to Blink. Sullivan is the name of the Discovery Institute, so maybe that's where it's from. 
I want to ask Guy, but he's off setting up equipment with Rocio and Kaylee this morning. We'll be as faithful as possible to the Sullivan prototype, but it was always meant to be a vehicle for the neuroscience, Levi says, firm and final as usual, with that competent, big dick calm of his, and everyone nods somberly, more so than one would expect from a bunch of dudes who throttle one another over donuts and come into work in their pajamas. There's clearly something I don't know. What is this place, Twin Peaks? Why is everyone so full of secrets? We hammer out details for a couple more hours, deciding that for the next weeks I'll focus on mapping the individual brains of the first batch of astronauts while engineering refines the shell. With Levi present, his team tends to agree to my suggestions more quickly a phenomenon known as sausage referencing. Well, to Annie and me, at least. In cock cluster or worst fest situations, having a man vouch for you will help you be taken seriously, the better regarded the man, the higher his sausage referencing power. Notable example, Dr. Curie was not originally included in the Nobel Prize nomination for the radioactivity theory she had come up with, until Gosta Mittag Leffler, a Swedish mathematician dude, interceded for her with the all-male award committee. Less notable example, halfway through my meeting with the engineers, when I point out that we won't be able to stimulate deep into the temporal lobe, maybe Fred tells me, actually, we can. I took a neuroscience class in undergrad. Oh, boy. That was probably two weeks ago. I'm pretty sure they stimulated the medial temporal lobe. I sigh. On the inside. Who? Something. Welsh. In Chicago. Jack Walsh. Northwestern. Yeah. I nod and smile. Though maybe I shouldn't smile. Maybe the reason I have to deal with this crap is that I smile too much. Jack did not stimulate the hippocampus directly, he stimulated occipital areas connected to it. But in the paper. Fred, Levi says. He's sitting back in his chair, dwarfing it, holding a half-eaten apple in his right hand. I think we can take the word of a PhD-trained neuroscientist with dozens of publications on this, he adds, calm but authoritative. Then he takes another bite of his apple, and that's the end of the conversation. See? Sausage referencing. Works every time. And every time it makes me want to flip a table, but I just move on to the next topic. What can I say? I'm tired. And now I crave an apple. My stomach growls when I slip out to fill my water bottle. I'm thinking wistfully of the lean cuisine currently unthawing at my desk when I hear it. Meow. I recognize the chirpy quality of it immediately. It's my calico, well, the calico, peeking at me from behind the water fountain. Hey, sweetie. I go down on my knees to pet her. Where did you go the other day? Chirp, meow. Some purrs. What are you doing all alone? A headbutt. Are you hunting mice? Do you work as sea law enforcement? I laugh at my own pun. The cat gives me a scathing look and wanders away. Oh, come on, it was a good joke. It was hysterical. One last indignant glare, and she turns the corner. I giggle, then hear steps coming up behind me. I don't look back. I don't need to, since I already know who it is. There was a cat, I say weakly. Levi walks past me to fill his water bottle. He's so tall, he needs to hunch over the fountain. His biceps shift under the cotton of his shirt. Was he this big in grad school? Or did I get even shorter? Maybe it's the stress. Maybe early onset osteoporosis is kicking in. Got her by some calcium set tofu. Right, he says, non-committal. His eyes are on the water. No, for real. Aha. Uh -huh. I'm serious. She went that way. I point to my right. Levi looks in that direction with a polite nod and then walks back inside the room, sipping his water. 
I stay on my knees in the dead middle of the hallway and sigh. I don't care if Levi Wardas believes me. He probably hates cats anyway. Equipment's ready. And I set up our computers, Rocio says as we walk back to our apartments. I smile into the soupy afternoon air. Awesome. How was working with Guy and Kaylee? How was working with your lifelong sworn arch foe? I give her the stink eye. Ro. My time with her is perfect practice for the adolescent daughter I might never have. It was fine, she mutters. I frown at her tone. You sure? Yeah. It doesn't sound fine. Is there a problem? Yes. Several. Global warming, systemic racism, the overpopulation of ecological niches, the unnecessary American remake of Swedish romantic horror masterpiece Let the Right One In. Rocio. I stop on the sidewalk. If there's something off in the way you're being treated, if Guy's making you uncomfortable, please feel free to. Have you seen Guy? She scoffs. He looks like the harmless love child of a meerkat and an altar boy. That is very rude and I blink, disturbingly accurate, but it sounds like you had an unpleasant day, so if there's anything that bothers you, I she mutters something I can't hear. I lean closer. What did you say? Another mumbled reply. What? I can't. I said, I hate Kaylee. She screams it so loud, a man pushing a stroller on the other side of the street turns to look at us. You hate. Kaylee? She whirls around and starts walking. I said what I said. I hurry after her. Wait, are you serious? I'm always serious. She's not. Did she do something to you? Yes. Then tell me, please. I put my hand on her shoulder, trying to be reassuring. I'm here for you, whatever it is. Her stupid curls, Rocio spits out. They look like a damn Fibonacci spiral. They're logarithmic, and their growth factor is the golden ratio, not to mention that they even look like spun gold. Is she Cinderella? Is this Disneyland Paris? I blink. Ro, are you? And what self-respecting person wears that much glitter? You ironically. I like glitter. No, you don't, she growls. I can only nod. Okay. Don't like glitter anymore. And earlier she dropped something and you know what she said? Oops. Lordy. She said, oh, Lordy. Do you understand why I cannot work with her? I nod to buy time. This is interesting. At the very least. I, um, understand that you two are very different and might never be friends, but I need you to overcome your revulsion for sequins. Pink sequins. For pink sequins, and to get along with her. Impossible. I quit. Listen, none of these things are grounds for a formal complaint. We can't police our co-workers' sense of fashion. Rocio frowns. What if I told you that she had a lollipop? The kind with gum inside? Still no. I smile. Wanna know something? Everything you feel about Kaylee, Levi feels about me. What do you mean? He hates my hair. My piercings. My clothes. I'm pretty sure he thinks my face is on par with a splatterpunk movie. Splatterpunk movies are the best. Somehow I don't think he'd agree. But he ignores the fact that I'm a total swamp hug so we can collaborate. And you should do the same. Rocio resumes walking, morose. Does he really hate the way you look? Yep. Always did. It's strange, then. What's strange? He stares at you. Plenty. Oh, no. I laugh. He puts a lot of effort into not staring at me. 
It's his crossfit. It's the opposite. At least when you're not looking. I'm about to ask her if she's high, but she shrugs. Whatever. If you won't support me in my hatred for Kaylee I have no choice but to call Alex and rage at him while I listen to Norwegian death metal. I pat her back. Sounds like the loveliest of evenings. At home, I just want to stuff my face with peanut butter cups and send 12 at what would Marie do tweets about the injustice of sausage referencing, but I limit myself to checking my DMs. I smile when I find one from Schmack. SHMAC, how are things? Marie, weirdly, much better. SHMAC, did camel dick burst into flames? Marie, lol, no. I do think he might be less of a camel dick than I thought. Still a dick, don't get me wrong. But maybe not camel. Maybe he's like, idk, a duck dick. SHMAC, have you ever seen a duck dick? Marie, no. But they're small and cute, right? I watch the wheel spin as the picture he sends me loads. I initially think it's a corkscrew. Then I realize that it's attached to a little feathered body am. Marie, OMG what is that abomination? SHMAC, your colleague. Marie, I take it back. I you and demote him. He's a camel dick again. Marie, how's your girlfriend? SHMAC, yet again, I wish. Marie, how are things with her? There's a long pause after, in which I decide to act like the motivated adult that I'm not and put on running shorts and my Marie Curie and the Isotopes European Tour 1911 t-shirt. SHMAC, a mess. Marie, how come? SHMAC, I fucked things up. Marie, beyond repair? SHMAC, I think so. There's a lot of history here. Marie, want to tell me? The three dots at the base of the screen bounce for a while, so I check my couch to 5k app. Looks like today I need to run 5 minutes, walk 1 minute, and then run 5 more minutes. Sounds feasible. Oh, who am I kidding? It sounds harrowing. SHMAC, it's complicated. Part of it is that I first met her when I was younger. Marie, please don't tell me you have a secret STEM lord past. SHMAC, I have an asshole past. Marie, how many ladies have you harassed on the internet? SHMAC, zero. But I did grow up in a hostile, uncommunicative environment. I was an uncommunicative person before I realized that I couldn't spend the rest of my life like that. I got therapy which helped me figure out how to deal with feelings that are overwhelming. Except every time I talk to her my brain blanks and I become the person I used to be. Marie, ouch. SHMAC, I never suspected how some of my actions came across, but in hindsight they make complete sense. Still, something she said makes me wonder if her husband told her some lies that aggravated the situation. Marie you should tell her. If it were me, I'd want to know. SHMAC, in the end it doesn't matter. She's happy with him. I take a deep breath. Marie, okay, listen. For years I thought that I was happy in a relationship with someone who turned out to be a chronic liar. And in my experience relationships that are based on lies can't last. Not in the long term. You'd be doing her a favor, if you came clean. I don't mention to him that all relationships can't last. People tend to get defensive when I do. They have to figure it out on their own. SHMAC, I'm sorry that happened to you. Marie, I'm sorry this is happening to you. SHMAC, look at us. Two sorry scientists. Marie, is there any other kind? SHMAC, 
not that I know of. My heart hurts for schmack as I put on my sneakers. I can't even imagine how awful it must be, to be in love with a married person. Heartbreaking situations like this vindicate the corporate mission of being corporated, keep up the defense. Never, ever fall for someone. If my heart gets broken again, neuroscience will be the one. It's sure to do a much cleaner job than stupid Tim, anyway. Dr. Curie would support me in this decision, I'm positive. I spring up from the couch and venture out into the soup-like Houston air for my run. If I run at the space center, someone I know might see me crawl my way about, and I wouldn't wish that sight upon an innocent bystander. Google comes to my aid, there's a little cemetery about five minutes away. Reading baby names like Alfred or Brockholst on gravestones might be a nice distraction from the gut-wrenching torment of exercising. I slip in my AirPods, start an Alanis Morissette album, and head that way. It's 6.43, which means that I can be home and showered in time to watch Love Island. Don't judge. It's an underrated show. Disappointingly, sitting on the couch thinking about working out has not improved my aerobic fitness. I realize it on minute three of my run, when I collapse in front of the tombstone of Noah F. Moore, surprisingly fitting, 1834-1902. I lie in the grass drenched in sweat, listening to my heart pound in my ears. Or maybe it's just Alanis screaming. I'm not meant for this. And by this I mean using my body for anything more strenuous than reaching for my treat cupboard. Which, incidentally, is all my cupboards. Yes, okay, Dr. Curie bonded with her husband over their shared love of cycling and nature walks, but we can't all be like her, gentlewoman, scholar, and athlete. When I notice that the sun is setting, I scrape myself off the ground, bid farewell to Noah, and start hobbling home. I'm almost back at the entrance when I notice something, there is no entrance. The tall gates I ran through on my way here are now closed. I try to shake them open, but no dice. I look around. The walls are too high for me to climb, because I'm five feet tall and everything is too high for me to climb. I take a deep breath. This is okay. It's fine. I'm not stuck in here. If I follow the walls I'll find a shorter segment I can easily climb over. Or not. I definitely haven't found one 15 minutes later, when Houston's family in dusk territory and I have to turn on my flashlight app to see a few feet away from me. I sum up the situation in my head, I'm alone, sorry, Noah, you don't count, stuck in a cemetery after sundown, and my phone is at 20%. Oops. I feel a wave of panic swell and immediately leash it. No. Down. Bad panic. No treats for you. I need to engage in some goal-oriented problem-solving before I can wallow in despair. What can I do? I could yell and hope someone hears me, but what could they do? Build a makeshift rope with their belts. Hum seems like a traumatic brain injury waiting to happen. Pass. I could call 911, then. Though 911 is probably busy saving people who actually deserve to be saved. People who didn't moronically get themselves locked inside a cemetery at night. Calling someone I know would be better. I could ask someone to bring me a ladder. Yes, that sounds good. I have the phone numbers of two people who currently live in Houston. The second doesn't count because I'll sleep cradled by the slimy arms of Noah's skeleton before calling it. But that's okay, because the first is Rocio, who could ask the super for a ladder and drive here in our rental. Let's be real, cemeteries at night are her natural habitat. She'll love this immensely. If only she bothered to answer her phone. I call her once, twice. Seven times. Then I remember that Jen ZS would rather roll around in nettles than talk on the phone, and I text her. No answer. My stupid battery is at 18%, mosquitoes are sucking blood out of my shins, and Rocio is probably having Skype sex to a band called Thor's Hammer. Who else can I call? 
How long would it take Riker to fly here? Is it too late to ask her for the number of nose tongue guy? What are the chances that Schmack secretly lives in Houston? Should I email Guy? But he has a kid. He might not check his email at night. My phone is at 12%, and my eyes fall on the 832 number in my incoming call log. I haven't even bothered saving it. Because I thought I'd never use it. I can't. I can't. I can't call Levi. He's probably at home, having a step forward dinner with his wife, playing with his dog, helping his daughter with math homework. Penny of the black curls. No. I can't. He'd hate me even more. And the humiliation. He's already saved me once. 9%, the world is pitch black, and I hate myself. There's no alternative. I have successfully defended a PhD dissertation, overcome a depressive episode, gotten my chuncha fully waxed every month for years, and yet tapping once on Levi's number feels like the hardest thing I've ever done. Maybe I should just settle in for the night. Maybe a pack of bobcats will let me snuggle in their pile. Maybe. Yes. Oh, shit. He answered. Why did he answer? He's a millennial, we also hate talking on the... Hello? Um, sorry. This is B. Koenigswasser. We, um, work together. At NASA? A pause. I know who you are, B. Right. Yes. So. I close my eyes. I am having a bit of a problem and I was wondering if you could. He doesn't hesitate. Where are you? See, I'm in this little cemetery by the space center. Greenwood? Green forest? Are you locked in? I how do you know? You're calling me from a cemetery after sundown. Cemeteries close at sundown. That would have been a useful piece of information four to five minutes ago. Yeah, so, the walls are sort of tall, and my phone is sort of dying, and I'm sort of. Go stand by the gates. Turn off the flashlight if you have it on. Don't talk to anyone you don't know. I'll be there in ten minutes. A beat. I've got you. Don't worry, okay. He hangs up before I can tell him to bring a ladder. And, come to think of it, before I can ask him to come rescue me. 9. Medial frontal cortex, maybe I was wrong. The second Levi appears I want to kiss him for rescuing me from the mosquitoes, and the ghosts, and the ghosts of the mosquitoes. I also want to kill him for witnessing the extent of the humiliation of B. Koenigswasser, human disaster. What can I say? I contain multitude. He steps out of an all-guzzling truck that I sadly have no right to complain about anymore, surveys the wall, and comes to stand on the other side of the gate. To his credit, if his smirking is doing it on the inside. His expression is neutral when he asks, you okay? Does thoroughly mortified count as okay? Let's say, yeah. Good. This is what we're going to do. I'll slide in the ladder through the gates, and you'll use it to get on top of the wall. I'll be on the other side to catch you. I frown. He sounds very, in charge. Self-assured. Not that he usually doesn't, but it's having a new effect on me. Oh my god. Am I a damsel in distress? How will we retrieve the ladder? I'll drive by tomorrow morning and pick it up. What if someone steals it? I'll have lost a precious heirloom passed down my family for generations. Really? No. Ready? I'm not, but it doesn't matter. He lifts the ladder like it's a feather and slides it through the gate. It feels a little less than cool when I find that it's so heavy, I can barely hold it upright. I tell myself that I have other talents as he has to patiently guide me through the process of releasing the catches and setting the safety mechanism. 
he must notice how annoying I find being coached, because he says, at least you know about the angular gyrus. I turn to hiss at him, but stop when I see his expression. Is he teasing me again? For the second time? In a day? Whatever. I climb up, which proves to be a nice distraction. Because you know how I mentioned that my body likes to faint? Well. Heights make it like to faint even more. I'm halfway to the top, and my head starts spinning. I clutch the sidebars and take a deep breath. I can do this. I can maintain normal blood pressure without passing out. I'm not even that high up. Here, if I look down I can. Don't, Levi orders. I turn to him. I'm a few inches taller, and he looks even more handsome from this angle. God, I hate him. And myself. Don't what? Don't look down. It'll be worse. How does he even know that? Look up. Take one step after the other, slowly. Yes, good. I don't know if his advice works, or if my blood pressure naturally spikes when I'm told what to do, but I make it to the top without crumpling like a sack of potatoes. At which point I realize that the worst is yet ahead. Just lower yourself from the edge, Levi says. He's standing right below me, arms raised to catch me, his head a few inches from my dangling feet. Jesus. Forget fainting. I'm about to bath. What if you don't catch me? What if I'm too heavy? What if we both fall? What if I break your neck? I will, you're obviously not, we won't, and you won't. Come on, B, he says patiently. Just close your eyes. See? This is what you get yourself into when you work out. Stay in the safe harbor of your couch, kids. You ready? He asks encouragingly. Trust falls. With Levi Wardas. God, when did this become my life? Dr. Curie, please watch out for me. I let myself go. For a second I'm suspended in air, sure that I'll splatter Humpty Dumpty style. Then strong fingers close around my waist, and I'm in Levi's arms for the second time in ten days. I must have pushed from the wall a little too forcefully, because we end up closer than I intended. My front rubs against him as he lowers me to the ground, and I feel everything. Everything. The hard muscles of his shoulders under my hands. The heat of his flesh through the shirt. The way his belt bites into my abdomen. The dangerous tingling in my lower belly as he what? No. I step back. This is Levi Ward. A married man. A father. A camel dick. What am I even thinking? Are you okay? I nod, flustered. Thank you for getting here so quickly. He looks away. He may be flushing. You're welcome. I'm so sorry to disrupt your evening. I tried to call Rocio, but she was. I'm not sure where. I'm glad you called me. Is he? I seriously doubt it. Anyway, thank you so much. How can I return the favor? Can I pay for gas? He shakes his head. I'll drive you home. Oh, there's no need. I'm just five minutes away. It's pitch black and there are no sidewalks. He holds the passenger door open, and I have no choice but to get in. Whatever. I can survive one more minute in close proximity with him. The inside of his truck is pristine and smells good not something I believed possible, with a handful of larabars in the back that make my stomach cramp with hunger, and a half-full camelback that I'd risk his germs for. He also drives a stick shift. HMPH show off. You're staying at the lodging facilities, right? I nod, pulling at the hem of my shorts. I don't like how high they ride when I sit. Not that Levi would ever voluntarily look at my thighs, but I'm a bit self-conscious, since Tim used to make fun of me for being bow-legged. And Annie would defend me, 
growl at him that my legs were perfect and his opinion was unnecessary, and I would. The truck starts. A familiar voice fills the cabin, but Levi quickly switches to NPR. I blink. The anchor is talking about mail-in ballots. Was that? Pearl Jam. Yeah. Vitalogy. Yep. Humph. Pearl Jam's not my favorite, but it's good, and I hate that Levi likes good music. I need him to love Dave Matthews Band. To stand the insane clown posse. To have a nickelback tramp stamp. It's what I deserve. What were you doing in a cemetery, he asks. Just, running. You run? He sounds surprised. Offensively so. Hey, I know I look like a wimp, but. You don't, he interjects. Look like a wimp, I mean. Just, in grad school you. I turn to him. The corner of his mouth is curving upward. I what? Once you said that time spent working out is time one never gets back. I have no memories of saying that. Especially to Levi, since we exchanged approximately twelve words at Pitt. Though it does sound like something I'd say. As it turns out, the higher your aerobic fitness, the healthier your hippocampus. Not to mention the overall connectivity of your default mode network and multiple axon bundles, so. I shrug. I find myself resentfully acknowledging that according to science, exercise is a good thing. He chuckles. Crow's feet crinkle the corners of his eyes, and it makes me want to continue. Not that I care about making him laugh. Why would I? I'm doing this couch to 5k program, but you. You? You. His smile widens a millimeter. How long's the program? Four weeks. How long have you been on it? Couple weeks. What distance are you up to? Point two miles. I hit the wall. On, um, minute three. He gives me a skeptical glance. To be fair, this is only my second time running since I was in middle school. The heat here is terrible. You might want to run in the morning. But you're not a morning person, right? He bites his lip pensively. I wonder how he could possibly know that, and realize that sadly, one needs only to take a look at me before 11am there's a gym in the space center you should have access to. I checked. It's not free for contractors, and I'm not sure the health of my nervous system is worth 70 bucks a month. Ari Shapiro is asking a correspondent about some Facebook lawsuit. You run five Burmese kiats? I ask. No. My eyes narrow. Is it because you only run marathons and above? I. He hesitates, looking sheepish. I run half marathons, sometimes. Well, then, I say conversationally as he pulls into the parking lot, thank you very much for the rescue and the ride, but I need to be alone so I can hate you in peace now. He laughs again. Why does it sound so nice? Hey, I struggle with running, too. I'm sure he does. Around mile 34 or so. Well, thanks. It's the second time you saved me. Despite the fact that we're nemeses. Outstanding, huh? The second. Yeah. I release the seat belt. The other time was at work. When I was almost pancaked. Ah. Something jumps in his jaw at the mention. Yeah. Well, have a great night. I pat my pockets. Apologies for I pat some more. Then I twist around in the seat, inspect it for something that might have slipped out, and find nothing. It's as pristine as when I got in. Ah. What's going on? I, I close my eyes, trying to remember my day. I put on shorts. Put my keys into the pocket. Felt them bounce against my leg while I was running, up until. Shit. I think they fell out when I collapsed on the grave. 
Damn you, no more, I mutter. What? I think I left my keys in the cemetery. I groan. Shit, the super leaves at seven. Jesus, what's wrong with this day? I bite my lower lip, rifling through options. I could sleep on Rocio's couch and go pick up my keys first thing in the morning. Of course, I'm not sure where Rocio is, or whether she'll come to the door. The fact that my phone is at 4% does not. I startle when Levi starts the truck again. Oh, thanks, but there's no need to go back to the cemetery. I wouldn't know how to get in, Anne. I'm not taking you to the cemetery. He's not looking at me. Fasten your seat belt. What? Fasten your seat belt, he repeats. I do, confused. Where are we going? Home. Whose home? My home. My jaw drops. I must have misheard. What? You need a place to stay, no. Yeah, but Rocio's couch. Or I'll call a locksmith. I can't come to your house. Why? Because, I say, sounding like a shrill twelve-year-old. Why is he being so nice all of a sudden? Does he feel guilty for not telling me about the NASA mess? Well, he should. But I'd rather sleep under a bridge and eat plankton than go to his place and see his perfect family life. Nothing personal, but the envy would gut me. And I can't meet his wife smelling like dirty socks and graveyard. Who knows what Levi already told her about me. You probably have plans for the evening. I don't. And I'd put you out. You wouldn't. Plus, you hate me. He briefly closes his eyes in exasperation, which worries me. He's driving, after all. Is there any non-imaginary reason you don't want to stay at my place, B, he asks with a sigh. I. It's very nice of you to offer, but I don't feel comfortable. That gets through to him. His hands tighten on the wheel and he says calmly, if you don't feel safe around me, I absolutely respect that. I'll drive you back to your place. But I'm not going to leave until I'm sure that you have a secure place to. What? No. I feel safe around you. As I say it, I realize how true it is, and how rare for me. There's often a constant undercurrent of threat when I'm alone with men I don't know very well. The other night guy came by my office to chat, and even though he's never been anything but nice, I couldn't stop glancing at the door. But Levi's different, which is odd, especially considering that our interactions have always been antagonistic. And especially considering that he's built like a Victorian mansion. It's not that. Then. I close my eyes and let my head fall back against the headrest. There's no way I'm going to be able to avoid this, is there? Might as well lean into the clusterfuck. Then, thank you, I say, trying not to sound as dejected as I feel. I'd love to stay with you tonight, if it's not too much trouble. The second I see Levi's house I want to burn it down with a flamethrower. Because it's perfect. To be fair, it's a totally normal house. But it perfectly matches my ideal, which, to be fair again, is not particularly lofty. My lifelong dream is a pretty brick home in the suburbs, a family with 2.5 children, and a yard to grow butterfly-friendly plants. I'm pretty sure a psychoanalyst would say that it has to do with the nomadic lifestyle of my formative years. I'm a stability slut, what can I say? Of course, when I say lifelong dream I mean until a couple of years ago. Once I realized how life-alteringly cruel humans can be, I scrapped the family part from the dream. The house lingers, though, at least according to the pang in my heart when Levi pulls up the driveway. First thing I notice, he grows hummingbird mint in his garden, nature's hummingbird feeder, and my favorite plant. Gah. Second, there are no cars in the driveway. Weird. But some lights inside are on, so maybe his wife's is just in the garage. Yeah, that's probably it. 
I jump out of the truck, which is unjustly tall, with already sore muscles and already itchy legs. Are you sure this is okay? He gives me a silent look that seems to mean haven't we been over this seven times already? And leads me up his driveway, where we're surrounded by a delightful amount of fireflies. I'm explosively jealous of this place. And I'm about to meet Levi's significant other, who probably has a nickname for me, her husband's ugly former lab mate. Something like Franken B. Or Bezilla. Wait, those nicknames are actually pretty cute. I hope for their sake that they came up with something meaner. The inside of the house is silent, and I wonder if the family is already asleep. Should I be quiet? I whisper. He gives me a puzzled look. If you want, he says at regular volume. Maybe the walls are soundproof. Either Levi is a very strict dad, or he and his wife are pros at picking up after their kid. The house is immaculate and sparsely furnished, no toys or clutter in sight. There are some engineering journals, a handful of sci-fi posters on the walls, and an open Asimov book on the coffee table, one of my favorite authors. How is this man I hate surrounded by everything I love? It's the ultimate mindfuck. There are three unused bedrooms upstairs. You can pick the one you like best. Three unused bedrooms. How big is this house? One's technically my office, but the couch pulls out. Do you want to shower? Shower? I didn't mean to, he looks flustered. If you want to. Because you ran. You don't have to. I don't mean to imply that. That I smell like the sweaty crotch of a trout. Ah. Uh. That I'm as dirty as a gas station restroom. He's definitely flustered, and I laugh. The blush makes him almost endearing. Don't worry. I smell gross and I'd love a shower. He swallows and nods. You'll have to use my EN suite. Soap and towels are in there. But isn't his wife? I can wash and dry your clothes if you want. Give you something of mine in the meantime. Though I don't have anything that will fit. You're very. He clears his throat. Small. Wait a minute, is he divorced? Is that why he doesn't wear a ring? But then he wouldn't have pics of his wife in his office, would he? Oh my god, is she dead? No, Guy would have told me. Or would he? You have an iPhone, right? He exits the living room and comes back holding out a charger. Here you go. I don't take it. I just stare up at his irritatingly handsome face, and God, this is driving me nuts. Listen, I say, perhaps more aggressively than I should, I know it's rude, but I'm too weird out not to, so I'm just going to ask you right out. I take a deep breath. Where is your family? He shrugs, still holding out the charger. It's not rude. My parents are in Dallas. My eldest brother lives on the Air Force base in Vegas, and the other recently deployed to Belgium. Not that family. Your other family. His head tilts. Does my father have a secret family you want to tell me about, or? No. Your kid, where is she? My what? He squints at me. There's a picture of her in your office, I say weakly. And Guy told me you two babysit together. Ah. He shakes his head with a smile. Penny's not my kid. But she gave me that picture. She made the frame in school. She's not his oh. You're with her mother, then? No. Lily and I dated briefly ages ago, but now we're friends. She's a teacher, and a single mother for the past year. Sometimes I'll watch Penny for her, or drop her off at school if she's running late. Stuff like that. Oh. Oh. Boy, do I love feeling like an idiot. So you live alone. He nods. And then his eyes widen and he takes a step back. Oh. I see. See what? 
why you asked. I'm sorry, I didn't even think that you might feel unsafe sleeping here if it's just the two of us. I will. Oh, no. I take a step forward to reassure him. I asked because I was curious. Honestly, it seemed incredibly weird to me that you, I realize what I'm about to say and snap my jaw shut before I continue. Levi's not fooled. Were you shocked that someone would marry me, he asks, biting back a smile. Yep. Not at all. You're smart. And, um, tall. Still have all your hair. And I'm sure that with women you don't hate you're nicer than you have historically been with me. B, I don't, he exhales hard. Get in the truck. Why? I'm driving you back to the cemetery and feeding you to the coyotes. Historically, I hurry to say. You've been nice to me today. You saved me from a zombie attack, for sure. And from Fred and Mark. He frowns. I'm not sure what's wrong with them. Lots of misogyny's my guess. I debate whether continuing. Then I think, fuck it. Also, it doesn't help that your team is exclusively male and almost exclusively white. I expect him to contradict me. Instead he says, you're right. It's appalling. You chose the members. He shakes his head. I inherited the team from my predecessor. Oh? The only new hire I made was Kaylee. He sighs. I officially reprimanded Mark. His behavior today is in his file. And I called a team meeting this afternoon, in which I reiterated that you are co-leader and that what you say goes. If anything like today ever happens again, let me know. I'll deal with it. Come, I'll find you something to wear. I'm a little shell-shocked that he called a meeting to officially sausage reference me, so I follow him without questions. The upstairs area is just as pretty as the first floor, but with more personality. I spot a vinyl player and CDS, pictures on the walls, even some pit swag I recognize from my own apartment. His bedroom, though, his bedroom is magic. Something out of a catalogue. It's a corner room with two large windows, wooden furniture, ceiling high bookshelves, and, in the middle of the king-sized bed, sleeping softly on top of the comforter. Are you allergic to cats, he asks, rummaging through a drawer. I shake my head, then remember that he's not looking at me. No. Scroding is probably going to leave you alone, anyway. He's old and grumpy. Scrodinger. I thought you hated cats. He turns with a confused look. Why? I don't know. You seemed a bit hostile toward my cat today. You mean, your cat that doesn't exist? Felicet exists. I have literally wiped boogers from her eyes, so. Felicet? I press my lips together. It's the name of the first cat in space. He lifts one eyebrow. And you named your imaginary cat after her. I see. I roll my eyes and drop the topic. There's nothing I want more than to pet the black ball of fur curled on the bed, but Levi's holding out a white v-neck t-shirt and... How offended would you be if I offered you boxes a friend gave me as a joke? They're very small, I don't think I've ever worn them. Is that flamingos? His cheeks redden. The size isn't the only reason I never wear them. Also, you might want this. It's a tube of itch relief cream. Thanks. How did you know? He shrugs, still a little flushed. You've been scratching your legs a lot. Yeah, bugs love me. I roll my eyes. My ex used to say that he only kept me around as a decoy for mosquitoes. Looking back to Tim's behaviors, it probably wasn't even a joke. Ten minutes later I make my way downstairs, hair wet and pine-scented, reflecting that out of all the implausible roller coasters of events that have befallen me in the past weeks, the weirdest is knowing that Levi and I use the same deodorant. 
what can I say? Men's products are cheaper, smell better, and block my BO more effectively. Not sure how I feel about the fact that Levi's armpits and mine have similar needs, but I'm going to let that slide. The kitchen, which is cozy and surprisingly well-equipped, smells like the most delicious meal I've never had. Levi works at the stove, he's back to me, and I'm reasonably sure that he's wearing the same shirt I have on in a different color. Except that it fits him perfectly. On me it looks like a circus tent. Food will be, he starts, and then stops when he turns around and sees me in the room. I grab two fistfuls of my shirt and pretend to curtsy. Thank you for this gown, my good sir. Yo. He sounds hoarse. You're welcome. Food will be ready in five minutes. I wince as he turns back to the pans and pots. There's no way he cooked without meat and dairy. God, why is he being so damn nice? Thank you, but. I pad to the stove. He's making tacos. Ah. Uh. I love tacos. You didn't have to. I was going to make myself dinner anyway. It's really kind of you to offer, but I doubt I can eat. I stop when my eyes fall to the filling. It's not meat, but portobello mushrooms. Beside a jar of dairy-free sour cream, and a bag of shredded plant-based cheddar. My eyes narrow. On impulse, I push on my toes and open the cabinet closest to me. I find quinoa, agar powder, and maple syrup. In the next one there are nuts, seeds, a package of dates. I scowl harder and move to the fridge, which looks like a richer, better version of mine. Almond milk, tofu, fruits and vegetables, coconut-based yogurts, miso paste. Oh my god. Oh. My. God. He's a vegan, I mutter to myself. He is. I look up. Levi is staring at me with a puzzled, patient expression, and I have no idea how to tell him that this is, like, the tenth thing we have in common. Sci-fi and cats and science and obviously men's deodorants and who knows what else. It's so incredibly upsetting to me, I can't even imagine how much he'd hate it if he knew. I toy with the idea of telling him, but he doesn't deserve it. He's been very nice today. Instead I just clear my throat. Um, me too. I figured. When you scolded me. About the donut. Oh, God. I'd forgotten about that. I bury my face in my hands. I'm sorry. So sorry. Believe it or not, I'm usually not a deranged asshole who scares her colleagues away from plant-based products. It's fine. I massage my temple. In my defense, you drive the least environmentally friendly vehicle. It's a Ford F-150. Pretty friendly, actually. Is it? I wince. Well, in another defense of mine, weren't you a hunter back in grad school? His shoulders stiffen imperceptibly. My entire family hunts, and I've gone on more hunting trips than I'd have liked as a teen. Before I could say no. That sounds awful. He shrugs, but it looks a little forced. Okay. I guess I have no defense at all. I'm just an asshole. He smiles. I didn't know you were a vegan, either. I remember Tim bringing you meat lunches back at Pit. Yeah. I roll my eyes. Tim was of the school of thought that I was being stubborn and that a taste of meat would convert me back to a regular diet. I laugh at Levi's appalled expression. Yeah. He'd sneak non-vegan stuff into my food all the time. He was the worst back then. Anyway, how long have you been a vegan? Twenty years, give or take. Ooh. Which animal was it for you? He knows exactly what I mean. A goat. In a cheese commercial. She looked so cogent. I nod somberly. It must have been very emotional. Sure was for my parents. 
We fought over whether white meat is really meat for the better part of a decade. He hands me a plate, gesturing for me to fill it. What about you? A chicken. Really cute. He'd sometimes sit next to me and lean against my side. Until, yeah. He sighs. Yeah. Five minutes later, sitting in a breakfast nook I'd literally give my pinky to own, plates full of delicious food and imported beer in front of us, something occurs to me, I've been here for one hour and I haven't felt uneasy, not once. I was fully ready to spend the night pretending to be in my happy place, with Dr. Curie under a blooming cherry tree in Noro, Japan, but Levi has made things weirdly, easy for me. Hey, I say before he can take a bite of his tacos, thank you for today. It can't be easy, to be so welcoming to someone you don't particularly get along with or like, or to have them stay in your house. He closes his eyes, like every other time I mention the obvious fact that there's no love lost between us, he is surprisingly truth averse. But when he opens them, he holds my gaze. You're right. It's not easy. But not for any reason you think. I frown, meaning to ask him what exactly he means by that, but he beats me to it. Eat up, B, he orders gently. I'm starving, so I do just that. 10. Dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, untruths. I'm going to switch off your speech center, now. Guy looks up from under his eyelashes with a defeated sigh. Man, I hate it when people do that. I laugh. Guy's the third astronaut I've tested this morning. He works on Blink, so we weren't originally planning to map his brain, but someone pulled out of the pilot group last minute. Brain stimulation is tricky business, it's complicated to predict how neurons will respond, and even harder in people who have a history of epilepsy or electric misfiring. Just drinking a cup of strong coffee can mess up brain chemistry enough to make a well-consolidated stimulation protocol dangerous. When we found out that one of the astronauts we selected had a history of seizures, we decided to give his spot to Guy. Guy was ecstatic. I'm going to target your broker's area, I tell him. Ah, yes. The famed broker's area. He nods knowingly. I smile. That would be your left posterior inferior frontal gyrus. I'll stimulate it with trains up to 25 hertz. Without even buying me dinner first. He clucks his tongue. To see whether it's working, I'll need you to talk. You can recite a poem, freestyle it, doesn't matter. The other astronauts I tested today chose a Shakespeare sonnet and the Pledge of Allegiance. Whatever I want. I position the stimulation coil one inch from his ear. Yep. Very well, then. He clears his throat. My loneliness is killing me and I, I must confess I still believe. I laugh, like everyone else in the room. Including Levi, who appears to be fairly close to Guy. It speaks highly of him, Guy, not Levi, I refuse to speak highly of Levi, considering he probably should have been Blink's leader. Guy doesn't seem to mind, at least judging by the chummy chat they had over some sports ball games lineup while I was setting up my equipment. My loneliness is killing me and I, I must see, Guy frowns. Sorry, I must see, he frowns harder. Must see, he sputters one last time, blinking fast. I turn to Rocio, who's taking notes. Speech arrest at MNI coordinates minus 38, 16, 50. The ensuing applause is unnecessary, but a tiny bit welcome. Earlier this morning, when the entire engineering team dragged their feet to the neurostimulation lab to observe my first brain mapping session, it was obvious that they'd rather be pretty much anywhere else. It was equally obvious that Levi had instructed them not to say so much as a peep about their total lack of interest. They're good guys. They tried to fake it. Sadly, there's a reason that in high school, engineers tend to gravitate toward the robotics shop instead of drama club. Thankfully, neuroscience has a way of defending her own honor. 
I just had to pick up my coil and show a few tricks. With stimulation at the right spot and frequency, decorated astronauts with IQs well into the triple digits and drawers full of graduate diplomas can temporarily forget how to count, whoa. Is that for real, or move their fingers, freaky, or recognize the faces of people they work with every day? B. How are you even doing that? And, of course, how to speak, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my entire damn life. Brain stimulation kicks ass, and anyone who says otherwise shall know her wrath. Which is why the lab is still crammed. The engineers were supposed to leave after the first demonstration but decided to stick around, indefinitely, it seems. It's nice to convert a bunch of skeptics to the wonders of neuroscience. I wonder if Dr. Curie felt the same when she shared her love for ionizing radiation. Of course in her case, long-term unshielded exposure to unstable isotopes eventually led to chronic aplastic anemia and death in a sanatorium, but you get my point. Which is that when I say, I think I got all I need from Guy. We're done for today, the room erupts into a disappointed groan. Levi and I exchange an amused look. To be clear, we're not friends or anything. One dinner together, one night sleeping in a room that happens to contain three quarters of my favorite books, and one yawny car ride to Noah Moore's grave, during which he politely respected that I'm not a morning person and remained blissfully quiet, did not make Levi and me friends. We still dislike each other, rue the day we met, wish the pox on the other's house, etc., etc. But it's like last week, over vegan tacos, we managed to form an uneasy, rudimentary alliance. I help him do his thing, and he helps me do mine. It almost feels like we're actually collaborating. Crazy, huh? For lunch, I heat up my ever-so-sad lean cuisine, grab a stack of academic articles I've been meaning to read, and make my way to the picnic tables behind the building. I've been nibbling on chickpeas for about five minutes when I hear a familiar voice. B. Guy and Levi are walking toward me, holding paper cups and sandwich bags. Mind if we join you? Guy asks. I do a little, since this paper on electrotherapy isn't going to read itself, but I shake my head. I shoot Levi an apologetic look, sorry you're stuck eating with me because Guy doesn't know that we're arch enemies but he doesn't seem to get it and takes a seat across from me, smiling faintly as though he doesn't mind. I watch the play of muscles under his shirt, and a frisson of warmth flicks down my spine. I'm weird. Guy sits next to me with a grin, and I think to myself, not for the first time, that he's wholesome, charming, and truly a cute guy. This is incredibly objectifying and reductive, and if you tell anyone I'll flatly deny it but back in grad school Annie told me that there are three types of attractive men. I don't know if she came up with this taxonomy herself, if Aphrodite announced it to her in a dream, or if she stole it from Teen Vogue, but here they are. There is the cute type, which consists of guys who are attractive in a non-threatening, accessible way, as a combination of their nice looks and captivating personalities. Tim falls into this group, just like Guy and most male scientists, including, I suspect, Pierre Curie. Come to think of it, all the guys who ever hit on me do, perhaps because I'm small, and dress quirky, and try to be friendly. If I were a dude, I'd be a cute guy, cute guys recognize that at some elemental level, and they make passes at me. Then there's the handsome type. According to Annie, this category is a bit of a waste. The handsome guy has the kind of face you see in movie trailers and perfume ads, geometrically perfect and objectively amazing, but there's something inaccessible about him. Those guys are so dreamy, they're almost abstract. They need something to anchor them to reality a personality quirk, a flaw, a circumscribed interest otherwise they'll float away in a bubble of boredom. Of course, society doesn't exactly encourage handsome guys to develop brilliant personalities, so I tend to concur with Annie, they're useless. Last but not least, the sexy guys. Annie would go on and on about how Levi is the epitome of the sexy guy, but I'd like to formally object. In fact, I don't even acknowledge the existence of this category. 
It's preposterous, the idea that there are men you can't help yourself from being attracted to. Men who give you the tingles, men you can't stop thinking about, men who pop up in your brain like flashes of light after stimulation of the occipital cortex. Men who are physical, elemental, primordial. Masculine. Present. Solid. Sounds fake, right? Hit me, guy tells me with a cute guy smile. What's wrong with my brain? Nothing, as far as I can tell. Amazing news. Could you help me convince my ex-wife that I'm certifiably sane? I'll write you a note. Nice. He winks at me. He winks at me a lot, I'm noticing. So, how are you liking Houston? I haven't really seen much yet. Besides the space center. And a cemetery, Levi interjects. I give him a dirty look and steal a cluster of his grapes in revenge. He lets me with a small smile. I could help you out, Guy offers. Sure, I say distractedly, busy glaring at Levi and making a show of chewing on his grapes. Really? Aha. Uh -huh. Levi lifts one eyebrow and bites into his sandwich. It feels a lot like a challenge, so I steal a strawberry, too. Maybe we could go to dinner, Guy says. Are you free tomorrow night? Levi and I instantly turn toward him. I mentally rewind the conversation, trying to recall what I agreed to. A date. Exploring Houston? Marriage? No. No, no, no. I have zero interest in dating, zero interest in Guy, and sub-zero interest in dating Guy. You know what I do have? Weird, intrusive thoughts. For instance, I'm currently remembering the way Levi's hands felt around my waist as he slid me down his body. Um, I. Or this weekend. Oh. I give Levi a panicked glance. Help. Please help. Thanks, um, but actually I. Just name the night. I'm flexible and. Guy, Levi says, voice deep and low. You might want to take a look at her left hand. I glance down, confused. My fingers are still clutching the strawberry. What does he owe? My grandmother's wedding ring. I put it on this morning. Some good luck for the brain mapping sessions. Shit, I'm sorry, Guy immediately apologizes. I had no idea that you. Oh, it's fine. I'm not. Married, I want to say, but it would be a waste of the amazing out leave I gave me. I cough. I'm not bothered. Okay. My apologies, again. He leans toward Levi, asking with a conspiratorial tone, out of curiosity, how big's her husband? And how prone to violent rage? Oh, no. I shake my head. He doesn't really exist. Don't worry, Levi tells Guy. Tim's mild-mannered. I facepalm internally. I can't believe Levi told Guy that I'm married to Tim. It's the worst, most easily disprovable lie ever. Couldn't he make up a random dude? Should I still get a groin protection cup? Guy asks. Levi shrugs. Might be safest. I look down at my chickpeas, wishing they were Levi's lunch. Fruits so much better. Believable lies are so much better. You sure you're not mad, B? Guy asks, a touch concerned. I didn't mean to make you uncomfortable. This is what I get for asking the wardass for help. I give Levi the stink eye, snatch another strawberry, and sigh. Nope. Not mad at all. Riker, what do you mean, Levi lied, and said you're married to Tim? B. he saw how flustered I was and tried to help me out. Riker, first, Guy Fieri has no business putting you in that position. B. not his name. B. but valid point. 
Riker, second, this is a terrible lie, easily refutable if Guy Fieri talks with literally anyone else who knows you. It's going to bite you in the ass. B. E. I I am aware. Riker, third, Levi does know you're not married to Tim, right? B. E. E. Yeah. He and Tim are buds, they collaborate. Levi was the one who told Tim to find someone better back in grad school. Riker, honestly, you should have just told Guy Fieri no. You screwed up. B. E. E. I know but you're my sister and I'm human I need love and compassion not judgment. Riker, you need a full psychiatric evaluation. Riker, but. I sip on a blueberry smoothie and look around the busy coffee shop, waiting for Rocio to show up for our first GRE tutoring session. It's probably going to be fine. My marital life, or lack thereof, is unlikely to come up with Guy. And I have other things to think about. Like the stimulation protocols I'm creating. Or income inequality. Or the fact that I haven't seen Felicette in a while, but I think she's been eating the little treats I left for her in my office. Important stuff. Did you know, Rocio greets me, sliding into the chair across from me, that blood is the perfect substitute for eggs. I blink. She takes it as an invitation to continue. 6 to 5 grams per egg. Exceedingly similar protein composition. Interesting. Not. You could have blood cake. Blood ice cream. Blood meringues. Blood papadelli. Blood pound cake. Blood omelette or, if you prefer, scrambled blood. Blood tiramisu. Blood quiche. I think I got the gist. Good. She smiles. I wanted to let you know. Just in case blood is vegan. I open my mouth to point out several things, but settle on, thank you, Ro, very thoughtful of you. Why is your hair wet? Please don't say blood. I went to the gym. I like to channel Ophelia in the lazy river, pretend I'm drowning in a Danish brook after a flimsy willow branch collapsed under my weight. What was she doing on a willow? She was mad. For love. Rocio glares at me. And they say a woman's heart is fickle. Right. Sounds like a nice pool. It's like a Sir John Everett Millet's painting. Except that swim caps are mandatory and medieval dresses forbidden. Fascists. Hmm. Maybe I should buy the membership after all. You don't need to, it's free for NASA employees. But not for contractors, right? They didn't make me pay. She shrugs and pulls a GRE prep book out of her backpack. Can we start with quantitative reasoning? Though parallelograms make me want to drown myself in a Danish brook. Again. Half an hour later, the reason my intelligent, math-savvy, Articulate I has been scoring so poorly on the GRE becomes unmistakably clear. This test is too dumb for her. In related news, we're about to murder each other. The correct answer is B, I repeat, seriously considering ripping a page off the book and stuffing it into her mouth. You don't need to solve for other options. X is a factor of Y squared. You're assuming that X is an integer. What if it's a rational number? A real number? Or, even worse, an irrational number? I guarantee you that X is not an irrational number, I hiss. How do you know, she growls. Common sense. Common sense is for people who are not smart enough to solve for pi. Are you implying that? Hey, girls. What? We bark in unison. Kaylee blinks at us from above a very pink drink. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no. I smile reassuringly. Sorry, we got carried away. We're having some issues. She's wearing a purple jumpsuit and heart-shaped sunglasses, and her hair is pulled over her shoulder into a fishtail braid that reaches her ribcage. 
Her purse is shaped like a watermelon, and her necklace is a pink flower with the letter K in its middle. I want to be her. A.W. She tilts her head. Can I help? There is something earnest about the way she asks, like she actually cares. I ignore Osio's kicks under the table and ask Kaylee, would you like to join us in fighting the hegemony of the graduate record examination? I'm not sure what reaction I expected, but Kaylee huffing, eye-rolling, and pulling a chair up to our table was not it. It's an indignity. GIE, SATS, all these tests are institutionalized gatekeepers, and the extent to which graduate programs over-rely on them for student admission is obscene. We are two decades into the 21st century, but we're still using a test based on a conceptualization of intelligence that's about as outdated as the Triassic. Graduate school success depends on qualities that are not measured by the GIE, we all know it. Why aren't we moving toward a holistic approach to graduate admission? Also, the GIE costs hundreds of dollars. Who has the financial solubility for that? Or for the prep courses, the materials, the tutors? Let me tell you who doesn't, not rich people. She wags her finger at me, precise and wildly graceful. I am mesmerized. You know who traditionally does poorly on standardized tests? Women and marginalized individuals. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, groups that are constantly told by society that they're less smart walk into a testing situation anxious as hell and end up underperforming. It's called stereotype threat, and there's tons of literature on that. Just like there's tons of literature showing that the GIE does a terrible job at predicting who'll finish grad school. But the heads of graduate admission all over the country don't care and persist in using an instrument made to elevate rich white men. She shakes out her hair. Burn it down, I say. Burn what down? All of it, Kaylee says fiercely with her high-pitched voice. Then she sucks a delicate sip from her straw. I really want to be her. I glance at Rocio and do a double take. She's staring at Kaylee, breathing quickly, lips parted and cheeks flushed. Her right hand clutches the prep book like it's the edge of a ravine. You okay, Ro? I ask her. She nods without breaking her stare. Anyway, Kaylee continues with a shrug, why are we talking about the GRE? Rocio is taking it, and I was helping her out. With, I clear my throat, mixed results. I believe we were about to shank each other over irrational numbers. Sounds about right, Rocio mumbles. Oh, Kaylee waves her hand airily, you shouldn't be talking about irrational numbers. The thing about the GIE is, the less you know the better off you are. I give Rocio my best told you so look. She kicks me again. If you take a prep class, they teach you little tricks useful to pass the test, more so than actually knowing math. You've taken the GIE? Rocio asks. Yep. This manager thing is a temporary gig, I'm starting my PhD in education in the fall. At Johns Hopkins. Rocio frowns. You're going to Johns Hopkins? Yes. Kaylee nods happily. My parents paid for a prep course, and I have tons of notes. Plus I remember most of it. Why don't I help you? Rocio turns to me with an aghast look that almost makes me laugh. Almost. Instead, I grab my smoothie and stand it's so lovely of you to offer. Rocio tries to kick me again, but I slither away. I'm going to check out the gym at the space center. Rocio said that it might be free. It is. Levi had me change your status the other day. Whose status? Yours. And Rocio's. She winks. I switched you to team members in the system, so you can get some of the perks. Oh, thank you. That was very unexpected. Out of character. Something you must have made up on the spot because why would he do that? Generous. Levi's awesome. Best boss I ever had. 
He harassed NASA into giving me health insurance. She smiles and turns to Rocio, who looks ready to drown herself in a Danish brook. Again. Where did you want to start? Rocio incinerates me with her eyes as I wave goodbye. Honestly, she's in excellent hands. Doesn't even deserve it. On the sidewalk, I take out my phone and quickly type up a tweet. At what would Marie do if one of the major obstacles preventing access to higher education were the GIE, a test that is one, expensive two, poorly predictive of overall graduate school success, and three, biased against individuals who are lower income, BIPOC, and non-CIS males. I slip my phone into my pocket, and my thoughts go back to the gym. Levi probably just wants me to be able to use it so he doesn't have to retrieve me from a different cemetery every week. Can't blame him, honestly. Yeah. That must be it. 11. Nuclear succumbence, gambling. Levi? Could you send me the newest? Blueprints are on the server, he mumbles around the miniature screwdriver he's holding between his teeth. He doesn't look up from the mound of wires and plates he's working on. It's past nine on a Friday. Everyone else has left. We're alone in the engineering lab, like most nights this week, in what I've come to think of as our hostile companionable silence. It's very similar to other types of silence, except that I know that Levi doesn't like me, and Levi knows that I know he doesn't like me and that I don't like him in return. But he doesn't bring it up, and I don't really think about it. Because we have no reason to. So, yeah. Our hostile companionable silence is basically a regular companionable silence. We sit facing each other at different workbenches. We dim the lights to see the shapes of the outside trees. We focus on our respective tasks. Every once in a while, we exchange comments, thoughts, doubts regarding Blink. We could do the same from our respective offices, but looking up from my laptop and verbally asking a question beats writing it out in an email. Typing out, hey, Levi and best, B is such a pain. Plus, Levi packs snacks. He brings them to work for himself, but he's lousy at gauging portions and always makes too much. So far I've had homemade trail mix, guac and saltines, rice cakes, popcorn, pita chips and bean dip, and about four kinds of energy balls. Yes, he's a better cook than I'll ever be. No, I'm not too proud to accept his food. I'm not too proud to accept anyone's food. Plus, I've been in Houston for a month, and we're already close to a working version of the prototype. I deserve some celebratory face stuffing. The old blueprint is on the server, not the new one. He takes the screwdriver out of his mouth. It is. I put it there. That's not the correct file. He looks up. Could you check again, please? I roll my eyes and sigh heavily, but I comply. Because today he made dark chocolate and peanut butter energy balls, and they were life-shatteringly good. Done. Still not here. Are you sure? Yes. It has to be there. He gives me an impatient look, like I'm pulling him away from the crucial task of securing the country's nuclear codes. It's not. Do you want to bet something on it? What would you like to bet? Let's see. His face when he finds that I'm right is going to be better than sex. Better than sex with Tim, for sure. A million dollars. I don't have a million dollars. Do you? Of course I do, I'm a junior scientist. He chuckles. Something flutters inside me, and I ignore it. Let's bet Schrodinger. I'm not betting my cat. Because you know you're going to lose. No, because my cat is 17 and needs regular manual expression of his anal glands. But if you still want him. I make a face. No, I'm good. I drum my fingers on my biceps, wondering what else Levi has that I want. 
I could make him cook for me every day for a month, but he's sort of already doing that without realizing. Why change something that works? If I win, you get a tattoo. Of what? A goat. Alive, I add magnanimously. Can't. Why? Already have one. I laugh. Oh, I've got it. Your mug? The one that says Yoda best engineer. Yeah? I want one. But it needs to say neuroscientist, of course. He lifts one eyebrow. This is the equivalent to someone buying their own world's best boss mug. Congratulations, you're officially NASA's Michael Scott. And proud of it. Okay, I say, turning my computer around for him to see. Deal. Come marvel at the lack of blueprints on the server. Wait. What about me? What about you? What will you do if I win? Oh. I shrug. Whatever you want. I'm right anyway. Would you like my hard-earned million dollars? Nope. He shakes his head, pensive. Should I come over and express poor Scrodinger's anal glands for the duration of my stay in Houston? Tempting, but Scrodinger's intensely private about his anus. He taps his masculine, chiseled chin. Huh? Why am I even noticing? If I win, you're going to sign up for a 5k here in Houston. I shrug. Sure. I'll sign up for a... And you're going to run it. I burst into laughter. There is no way. Why? Because I'm currently on step 4 of my program, and still unable to run more than half a mile without collapsing. Running a 5k sounds about as pleasant as bloodletting. By leeches. I'll run with you. You mean, you'll walk next to me with your 70 mile long legs? I'll train you. Oh, Levi. Levi. You sweet summer child. I point at myself. Tonight I'm wearing a nose stud, galaxy leggings, and a white tank top. My purple hair is loose on my shoulders. I'm pretty sure one of my back tattoos is visible. Everything about me screams Levi's kryptonite. You see this scrawny, stunted, unmuscled body? It's built to live in parasitic symbiosis with a couch. It resists training with the force of many million ohms. Levi does stare at my body for a considerable amount of time, but then he looks away, flushed. Poor guy. Must be a tough sight for him. It doesn't matter, does it? Since you're sure that you'll win? True. I shrug. Deal. Come taste the bitterness of defeat. He does come, stalking to my bench in a few strides with those ridiculous 70 mile long legs. However, he doesn't stop in front of the laptop I conveniently turned for him. Instead he circles around the bench, comes to stand behind me, and then slides the computer in our direction. For me to better witness his impending massacre, I assume. I can't wait to sip your tears out of my new mug, I murmur. We'll see. He leans his left hand against the bench and grabs the mouse with the other. Even on my high stool, he's still many inches taller than me, effectively caging me at my seat. It should feel uneasy, suffocating, but he leaves me enough room that I don't mind. Plus, I know it doesn't mean anything. Because he's Levi. And I'm B. It's actually almost pleasant, the heat he radiates in the blasting AC. He could have a successful second career as a weighted blanket. This is weird. I hear the frown in his voice. The file's missing. Can the mug be 20 ounces? It should be here. He leans forward, and his chin brushes the crown of my hair. It's not terrible. Sort of the opposite. I saved it. Maybe you dreamt it. Sometimes in the mornings I think that I got up and brushed my teeth even though I'm still in bed. 
though with my new mug I'll be extra motivated to wake up early and have my coffee. Weird. Pity is not paying attention to my gloating. I'm doing a pretty good bit, if I say so myself. Look. He types quickly, the inside of his elbows brushing against my upper arms, pulling up a log interface. See? Someone, me, saved the file at 1.16pm. Then at 4.23 someone else removed it. I know immediately where he's going with this. I tilt my neck back to look up at him, and he's already staring down from two inches above. God, his eyes. He invented a new color green. It wasn't me. I blurt out. How much do you want my cat? Considerably less now that I know about his colorectal issues. And my mug? A lot, but I swear it wasn't me. He hums skeptically. I can feel his breath against my face. Mint, with a hint of peanut butter. I'm inclined to believe you, but only because this is not the first time. What do you mean? The frequencies list for the parietal electrodes you sent me yesterday. The one you emailed and put on the server. It wasn't there. I scowl. But I put it there. I know. The engineers complained about missing and misplaced files, too, corrupted stuff. Lots of little things. Probably a server error. Or people screwing up. Can you tell who moved the file? He types a few more strokes. Not from the logs. The system isn't coded that way. You know what it can do? I shake my head, bumping against some spot on his chest. It can tell me where the file was moved, and if it's still on the server but in a different folder. Which in the case of the blueprints is, he presses the spacebar and pulls up an image right here. Oh, perfect. That's exactly what I was, my teeth click as I shut my mouth. Wait a minute. What 5k should we sign up for? He's roaming the inside of his cheek with his tongue. There's usually a space-themed one in June. No way. I twist around. The file was not where it was supposed to be. The terms of the bet were that the file should be on the server. He gives me a satisfied smile. Bet you're glad I didn't agree to the anal expression. You know I meant in a specific folder. How unfortunate that you didn't specify, then. He puts a hand on my shoulder in mock reassurance I seriously consider biting it off and it's ridiculous how much every part of him dwarfs every part of me. Also ridiculous. The way those stupid intrusive thoughts of his body pressed against mine can't seem to let up. And that having him so close reminds me of his thigh pushing up between my legs, solid and insistent against the seam of my. What are you two doing? Boris is standing in the entrance of the lab, and my first instinct is to push away from Levi and scream that nothing happened, nothing happened, we were just working. But the distance between us is perfectly appropriate. It just feels like it isn't, because Levi is so large. And warm. Because he's Levi. We were just about to sign up for a 5k, he says. How are you, Boris? A 5k, huh? He stays under the doorframe, studying us with his customary tired expression. Actually, I come bearing news. Bad news. Not good. Bad, then. Boris comes closer, holding a printout. You guys planning to go to human brain imaging? HBI is one of many academic conferences in neuroscience. It's not particularly prestigious but over the years it has cultivated a party reputation, it takes place in fun cities, with lots of satellite events and industry sponsorships. It's where young, hip neuroscientists network and get drunk together. But I'm not hip. And Levi is not a neuroscientist. No, I tell Boris. Where is it this year? New Orleans. This coming weekend. Fun. You planning on going? He shakes his head and holds out the printout. 
no. But someone is. Magtech? Levi says, reading from above my shoulder. We've been keeping tabs on them. The company will present a version of their helmets at HBI. Have they filed for a patent? Not yet. Then going public seems like a less than intelligent move. I think they're trying to get visibility to pull in new investors. Which is a great opportunity for us to find out where they're at. You're suggesting we send someone to New Orleans, have them attend HBI, and report back on what Magteca's progress is compared to ours? No. Boris smiles for the first time since stepping inside the room. I'm ordering the two of you to do that. I just don't think that driving to New Orleans to play Inspector Gadget is the best use of our time, I tell Levi as he walks me home like he insisted on, Houston is dangerous at night, you never know who's lurking around, either you let me walk you home, or I follow ten feet behind you. Your choice. He's pushing his bike, which he apparently rides to work most days. HMPH overachiever. His helmet, strapped to his belt, bounces against his thigh every few steps. The soothing rhythm provides a solid backdrop to my bitching. We're at least Inspector Columbo. Gadget outranks Columbo, I point out. Don't get me wrong, I see the value of keeping tabs on the competition, but wouldn't it be better to send someone else? No one else is as familiar with Blink as we are and you're the only person who knows the neuroscience. Fred did take that class in undergrad. Levi smiles. At least it's over the weekend. We won't miss work days. I lift one eyebrow. We've both worked every single weekend. Why are you taking this so well? He shrugs. I pick my battles with Boris carefully. Isn't this worth fighting for? We're talking about two days in close quarters with the person you most despise in history. Elon Musk is coming, too. No, me. He sighs heavily, rubbing his forehead. We've been over this, B. Besides, the team keeps screwing up basic stuff like file backup, he adds wryly. I wouldn't trust them with espionage. He smiles when he says the last word, and my heart jumps. I'm inexplicably getting cute guy vibes from him maybe because when he's amused he looks damn cute. I still think it's not human error, I say, trying not to think about things like cuteness. Either way, I'll call a meeting with the engineers and scare them into being more careful. Wait. I stop under my building. You can't do that if you're not sure that it's someone on the team. I'm sure. But you have no proof. He looks at me with a puzzled expression. You don't want to accuse them of something they might not have even done, do you? They did. I huff, frustrated. What if it's a weird fluke? It's not. But you, I press my lips together. Listen, we're co-leaders. We should make disciplinary decisions together which means that you can't accuse anyone of anything until I'm on board, too. And that's not going to happen until I see actual proof that someone on the team is doing this. He's looking down at me with a soft, amused expression, as if he finds my irritation particularly endearing. What a sadist. Okay. I prompt him. He nods. Okay. He unlocks his helmet and ties it under his chin. I most definitely do not notice the flex of his biceps. And, B. Yeah? He mounts the bike and starts riding away. I'll let you know which 5k I settle on. He's giving me his back, but I flip him off anyway. 12. Ventral striatum, yearning. SHMAC, that GRE tweet is becoming a bit of a thing, huh? It sure is. If by bit he means a lot. And if by thing he means shitstorm. I have no idea how it even happened. 
The day I sent the tweet I went to bed after reading comments of people talking about their negative experiences with the test. When I woke up, there was a hashtag, hash fair graduate admissions, and dozens of associations of women and minorities in STEM had announced a GIE strike, encouraging students to turn in their grad school applications without the GIE. At Olivia A. Bio if everyone does it, grad programs will have no choice but to evaluate us based on our experiences, CV, previous efforts, and skills. Basically, what they should already be doing. Have I mentioned how much I love women in STEM? Because I love women in STEM. Two hours later, a journalist from the Atlantic messaged me, asking for an interview. Then CNN. Then Chronicle of Higher Ed. Then Fox News, as if. I paired up with Schmack to reach an even wider audience, and together we issued a thousand-word essay summarizing the lack of scientific evidence supporting the use of the GIE as an admission tool. I encouraged news outlets to interview the women who started the hashtag, except for Fox News, which I left on read. Several people came forward and talked to the media about the number of minimum wage hours necessary to afford the test, about their frustration when wealthier classmates with access to private tutoring performed better, about the crushing disappointment of being rejected by dream institutions despite perfect GPAs and research experience because their scores didn't meet some arbitrary cutoff by a few percentage points. They're still doing the rounds, with more people opening up. Hash fair graduate admissions is a movement, and it has a real chance at getting rid of this stupid, unfair test. I've been all a flutter. You know who else has been a flutter? Rocio. Who barged into the office declaring, I won't be preparing for the GIE anymore, in solidarity with my brethren. Johns Hopkins will have to acknowledge how badass I am from my other application materials. I looked up from my laptop and nodded. I support that. You know why this is happening, right? She leaned conspiratorially over my desk. The other day we talked about how shitty the GIE is, and now people are rallying against it because Marie started the conversation. It can't be a coincidence. Oh, I stammered. Well, it probably is just a coincidence. There are no coincidences, she said, beautiful dark eyes staring into mine. B, we both know who I owe this to. Oh, I'm sure. La Lorona. She took her phone out of her pocket and showed me pictures of beautiful creeks. Her eyes shone. I've been visiting nearby places where she was sighted, leaving little tokens of appreciation. Tokens. Yes. Tarot's, poems I wrote extolling the beauty of the macabre, pentagrams made of twigs. The usual. The usual. I think it's her way of saying, Rocio, I recognize a kindred spirit, perhaps even a successor in you. She smiled at me, setting her bag on her desk. I am so happy, B. I smiled back and went back to work relieved that Rocio doesn't suspect who's behind WWMD. Sometimes I wonder if Dr. Curie, too, had a secret identity she couldn't reveal. Period-wise, she could have been Jack the Ripper. Never say never, right? Marie, do you think we're actually going to get rid of the GRE? SHMAC, we're closer than ever, for sure. Marie, agreed. Thank you for helping out by the way. Schmack and I have the same number of followers but completely different reaches. I hate thanking dudes for sausage referencing, but truth is, there are plenty of male academics who'd rather guzzle curdled milk than engage with WWMD. Which is fine, because I'd love nothing more than pouring gallons of curdled milk down their throats. Still, hash fair graduate admissions can use all the support it can get. Marie. How's the girl? SHMAC, how's camel dick? Marie, astonishingly, we're almost getting along. If we haven't come to blows yet, are we even collaborating? Also, nice deflection. Tell me about the girl. SHMAC, everything's fine. Marie, fine has variable definitions. 
narrow it down. SHMAC, how narrow? Marie, very. SHMAC, okay. Narrowingly, things are great, in the worst possible way. We've been working together a lot because that's what the project demands. Which might be why I'm on my fourth beer on a Thursday night. Marie, why is working together bad? SHMAC, it's just. I know things about her. Marie, things? SHMAC, I know what she loves to eat, what shows she watches, what makes her laugh, her opinions on pets. I know her dislikes, aside from me. I've been cataloguing a million little quirks of hers in my head, and they are enchanting. She is enchanting. Smart, funny, an incredible scientist. And there are things. Things I think about. But I'm drunk, and this is inappropriate. Marie, I love inappropriate. SHMAC, do you? Marie, sometimes. Hit me. SHMAC, I need you to know that I'd never do anything to make her uncomfortable. Marie, schmack, I know that. And if you ever did, I'd cut your dick off with a rusty scalpel. SHMAC, fair. Marie, tell me. The clock in the kitchen ticks on. Late night cars make soft noises past the window, and the screen of my phone goes black. I don't think schmack will continue. I don't think he'll open up, and it makes me sad. Even though I don't know anything about his life, I get the impression that if he doesn't do it with me, he won't with anyone else. My eyes drift closed, accustomed to the dark, and that's when my screen lights up again. The air rushes out of my lungs. SHMAC, I know what she smells like. This little freckle on her neck when she pulls up her hair. Her upper lip is a little plumper than the lower. The curve of her wrist, when she holds a pen. It's wrong, really wrong, but I know the shape of her. I go to sleep thinking about it, and then I wake up, go to work, and she is there, and it's impossible. I tell her stuff I know she'll agree to, just to hear her hum back at me. It's like hot water down my fucking spine. She's married. She's brilliant. She trusts me, and all I think about is taking her to my office, stripping her, doing unspeakable things to her. And I want to tell her. I want to tell her that she's luminous, she's so bright in my mind, sometimes I can't focus. Sometimes I forget why I came into the room. I'm distracted. I want to push her against a wall, and I want her to push back. I want to go back in time and punch her stupid husband on the day I met him and then travel back to the future and punch him again. I want to buy her flowers, food, books. I want to hold her hand, and I want to lock her in my bedroom. She's everything I ever wanted and I want to inject her into my veins and also to never see her again. There's nothing like her and these feelings, they are fucking intolerable. They were half asleep while she was gone, but now she's here and my body thinks it's a fucking teenager and I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. There is nothing I can do, so I'll just not. I can't breathe. I can't move. I can't even swallow the knot in my throat. I might actually cry. For him. For this girl, who'll never know that someone holds these mountains of want inside. And maybe for me, because I've made the choice to never feel this, never again. Never ever, and I realize now, now for the first time, what a terrible price I will pay. What a loss it will be. Marie, oh, schmack. What else is there to say? He's in love with someone who doesn't love him back. Who is married? This story has no happy ending. And I think he knows, because he only replies with. SHMAC, yeah. Hey, B. I set aside my article and smile at Lamar. What's up? Not much. Just wanted to tell you that I've updated the log system on the server. Oh? Yeah. Nothing is changing on your end, but now users removing, 
replacing, or modifying files are automatically tracked. If something's iffy, we'll know who's responsible. Great. I frown. Why did you do that? Because of the issues. The issues? Yeah. Missing files and all that. Levi called an engineering meeting to tear us a new one and asked me to change the server code. He shrugs sheepishly. Sorry about the mess. He slips out of my office, leaving me to stare at my article. I am still staring three minutes later when someone else knocks on the doorframe. What's with your return event? Levi's in the entrance, filling it like Lamar couldn't quite manage. It's missing the grill. I'll call maintenance. No. I swivel around. It's how Felicet gets inside at night. To eat the treats I leave for her. He lifts one eyebrow. You want an uncovered vent because you're imaginary cat. She's not imaginary. I found a paw print next to my computer the other day. I texted it to you. And he replied, looks like a splotch of lean cuisine. I hate him. Right. About tomorrow, we should head out early since New Orleans is over five hours away. I don't mind picking up the rental and driving. You can sleep in the car, but I'd like to leave around six. You called the meeting. He cocks his head. A wisp of black hair falls on his brow. Excuse me. You told the engineers about the missing files. Ah. He presses his lips together. I did. I stand without knowing why. Put my hands on my hips, still not knowing why. I asked you not to. B. It needed to be done. We agreed that we wouldn't until we had proof. He folds his arms on his chest, a stubborn line to his shoulders. We didn't agree. You told me you didn't want to call a full meeting about it, and I didn't. But I'm head of the engineering division, and I decided to tell my team about the issue. I snort. Your team is everyone but me and Rocio. Nice loophole. Why does it bother you so much? Because. You're going to have to be a little more articulate than that. Because you did it behind my back. I bristle. Just like a month ago, when you didn't tell me about NASA trying to get Blink cancelled. It's not the same at all. It is in theory. And it's a matter of principle. I bite the inside of my cheek. If we're co-leaders, we need to agree before taking disciplinary measures. No disciplinary measure was taken. It was a five-minute meeting in which I asked my team to stop messing around with important files. I run a tight ship, and my team knows it, no one made a big deal about this except for you. Then why didn't you tell me you were going to do it? His eyes harden, hot and dark and frustrated. He scans my face, silent, and I feel the tension rise in the room. This is about to escalate. To a full-blown fight. He'll yell at me to mind my business. I'll throw my lean cuisine at him. We'll pummel each other, people will rush to separate us, we will cause a spectacle. But he just says, I'll pick you up at six. His tone is steely. Inflexible. Cold. So different from the one he's used with me for the past five weeks. I wonder why that is. I wonder if he hates me. I wonder if I hate him. I wonder so much that I forget to answer him, but it doesn't matter. Because he's already gone. End part one.